four police interceptor SUV all wheel drive hybrid vehicle from council approved vehicle replacements, a new addition from replacement years 2022, 2023, and 2024. This will allow the city to purchase these vehicles, which are the city's fleet standard for brand and models, as well as with the hybrid option, which is a council goal for the new vehicles that's possible and available. Staff had discussed the vehicle purchasing problems that have been experienced at the January 2023 Public Works Committee meeting and have explored many vehicle purchase options without any good results. We have tried to obtain these vehicles from the Washington State DES contracts and have experienced continued order cancellations mm -hmm. and limited quality uh, quantities allocated to the city of Bremerton. We had even solicited a vehicle purchase bid invitation to local dealerships with no response. Mm -hmm. With the urgent need for police vehicle replacements of 16 and the next budget year expected amount of police vehicles per replacement due to criteria being met of four, this cooperative agreement and purchase opportunity is very important to equipment services division staff and especially for the police. This Arizona vehicle purchasing agreement is currently being used by many municipalities and agencies within Washington state, such as the cities of Port Orchard, Lakewood, Fife, Linwood, the city of Seattle, as well as for King County as a way to obtain vehicles for their agency. This agreement will also be beneficial for other pending vehicle replacements, such as trucks and vans that we have been unable to order through the state of Washington uh, purchasing contracts. But know that our priority now is for uh, police vehicle purchases. This agreement and purchasing approach has been reviewed and approved to move forward by the city's legal department, the finance department, and the city's contract administrator and has had a thorough review and action determination by the MRSC procurement and contracting consultant. I will answer any questions you may have on this item. All right, thank you, Mr. Montner. Um, does anyone in the public, either online on Zoom or in the room here, want to comment on this item? Actually, I have control of Zoom now so I can see if anyone's raising their hand. Mm -hmm. All right, hearing and seeing none, um, we'll actually go to the council for a motion on this item. Uh, council Member Mockler. Move to approve the Arizona State Purchasing Cooperative Agreement and authorize the mayor to finalize and execute the agreement with substantially the same terms and conditions as presented. Council Member Younger. Second. All right, motion is second, open for discussion. Any questions or comments? So, good evening, Mr. Montner. Um, so why Arizona? Uh, all of these smaller cities and Seattle and King County are going to Arizona? Right. With the, with the state of Washington contract uh, for uh, vehicle purchasing closed and uh, no, uh, does not appear to, they're going to open it up to purchasing anytime soon. Um, every, there are a lot of agencies, as I mentioned, going through the Arizona state contract there. Uh, one of, they're the fifth largest uh, dealership for uh, government sales in the United States. So that's uh, been available to most everybody on the on the West Coast, as well as uh, other regions uh, close like Idaho, uh, Montana, and, and Arizona, of course. So well, drivers from this dark, cold, wet place be allowed to go to Arizona and drive the vehicles back here? They, they'll actually, sorry, be, just to they'll home. actually yeah. be delivered. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, that's that's just so mind boggling. Okay, um, I, I don't really have any further questions on this one. Uh, I'd like to commend the Public Works Department for finding a workaround for this one so that we have vehicles for the police force. And it was a lot of, of research by uh, uh, Captain Elton as well uh, from BPD that uh, assisted with finding the source. Thank you, Captain Elton. Any other questions, comments? Hey, Mr. Mottner. Hi. Um, okay, so which vehicles, um, how many vehicles are we short on and which cancellations did you, I mean, tell me about the cancellations. So we placed an initial order for nine Ford uh, lease vehicle hybrid models, uh, 
typically uh, like we normally do with the state of Washington DES uh, contract. They remained as orders pending until they canceled the, those orders. Right. With us. So, so we had those nine uh, in or, where we thought were ordered, but in uh, when come to find out they they were not ordered for us or, or the order wasn't placed mm -hmm. in for manufacturing. Okay. So, so there were nine from 2022 and then there's two from 2023 and five from 2024. And then as I mentioned, the four uh, expected for the 2025. So, so we're looking at uh, placing an order as soon as possible for 16, but then again, it, it's very well going to be 20. Okay. Um, and these are already ones that we've approved in our budget. I mean, we're talking out into 25. Did we approve those ones already? No, no okay. the, those are, are still pending approval in okay. next year's budget for the 2025 replacement. Okay. So we wouldn't necessarily be ordering the ones from 25. No. Um, did we approve the ones from 24? Yeah. Okay. So then we're talking 11, uh, 16, um, but you said it was probably going to be 20. Um, uh, Right. Uh, sorry to interrupt. It would be, no uh, you know, this opportunity may be available to us for that. Our preference is to purchase from the state of Washington uh, sure. EES contracts like we normally do, uh, but they are unavailable. So that's why we're, we're looking at this as our purchasing option. And I appreciate that you said you reached out and did a bid uh, for local dealers and you had no response on that. So yes. tell me a little bit about how you did outreach for um, putting the bid out for local dealerships. So we were really excited to get that to that point of opportunity to yeah. offer to local dealerships um, for they are unable to uh, supply police interceptor okay. vehicles, but we had sent the bid out for uh, Ford Mavericks, as well as two okay. uh, Chevy or a two uh, Ford pickup trucks, uh, an F-250 and an F-350 truck. And we're excited and hope that we would get a bid in mm -hmm. from the local dealership and and we're surprised when when they did not uh, put that in. So there's, there's one particular person that I'm thinking of that talked to me personally, said, oh, you should order more locally. We would do it if we could. And, right. and yeah. uh, we did, we tried. So, yeah, okay. It, it was advertised and then even hand delivered to the local Ford dealership in town. Here. Okay. And, uh, All right. We were really hoping that it was going to yeah. come in last minute. We were waiting down here with Angela, hoping they hand delivered it at that time, but they, they did not uh, place a bid, but that doesn't uh, end our attempt to buy locally from other dealerships or some other vehicles that we're open to still uh, advertise that way for, for local. That'd be great, yeah. Um, and so um, the ones that we've approved already, um, I'm assuming, yeah, you'd go ahead and put an order in for those. And um, then I'm just like, when I'm thinking about 25, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's not likely, but it's possible that there could be more supply within the Washington state system. Um, so I'm just curious if you're going to try that again before you try the Arizona co-op. Of, of course. We okay. Will, yes. All right. Yeah. Thank yes, you very much. They, they become available on the Washington uh, DES contract list that, that would change this tremendously, you know, the go uh, from the Washington state. Thank you very much for your answers. Fantastic. Any other comments, questions? All right. So no, no, I appreciate all the, opportunity to buy local when we can, but when we can't, uh, when supplies are short, we're in competition with every other city out there. So I really appreciate you all jumping on this opportunity to secure these for our city. Sounds great. So with that, I'll call for the question. And since you don't have our normal uh, clerk here, I know per our bylaws, any council member can, oh wait, I'm sorry, Lori's up here. Oh, all right, Lori, okay. jump, jump in as deputy clerk. All right. <laughs> Chamberlain. Yes. Fry? Yes. Good now? Yes. Mockler? Yes. Younger? Is he younger? Yes. Oh. Coughlin? Yes. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I wanted to take a second before we move on to. Uh, 
We didn't have the audio on, I was on mute. So for anyone online watching, thanks as we navigate our new technical setup that hopefully is working well. So oh, no. yeah, okay. send in any comments. I think the only thing I missed was Council Member Danny, he is absent tonight. Um, but besides that, we'll have our normal study session going forward. Oh, and item B7 will be moved up after item B1 for anyone who didn't catch that. All right, so with that, we'll move on to item B1. We have Stormwater Permit Coordinator Chance Perfume here to present Goods and Services Agreement with Aqua Technics LLC for Aquatic Treatment and Vegetation Harvesting of Kitsap Lake. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good evening, Council. And we are on year four of Kitsap Lake's Water Quality Improvement <laughs> Project. And this time, I figured we would go with a three year contract instead of doing this every single year. Um, although I do like coming in to talk about the lake and our progress. And, Recently, of course, we, we are aware we had some algae issues, but you know, I think some of that will be addressed with our upcoming stormwater treatment retrofits. We'll help take some of that nutrient out of the water column. So right now we're talking about the aquatic aqua techniques contract for 2023 through 2025. I've set the uh, a discussion I had with uh, Aquatechnics set the price at about $175,000 for three years, which is, so I'm surprised that they actually agreed with that um, because of the economy and the cost of inflation and everything that's going on. One of the changes that we did do to reduce the cost is we switched from pause lock to uh, what's called uh, Utrazorb G, which is essentially the same product. It's a uh, lanthanum based. Um, a product that is the same thing that we've been doing. It's 10% concentrated instead of five. Uh, so we have to use less. So with less, we save money in that regard. Uh, so this is going to address the harvesting for the lake as well as the uh, algae control phosphorus sequestering. Um, the schedule, as they said in the contract, so we're looking at doing the treatment in um, May. In June, and we're harvesting in late June and early July. And this summer, we're doing the second application after the harvesting to sequester any phosphorus that gets released from the harvesting effort. Um, so, Mr. I'm looking for your approval to move this forward. Excellent. Comments, questions? Buddy? So, I, I'm not going to belabor this, but so you think that it might have been the act of har harvesting that um, released phosphorus last year, or it's a possibility? Well, we had discussions with another firm at the beginning of this whole process, and they suggested that it is possible that phosphorus is released excessively from the cut vegetation. So because we did the phospholog treatment before harvesting, that was kind of a test. So year three of the whole process, we switched things around a little bit. So now we know not to do that because I do think that it was the good cause of that uh, late summer bloom. Okay, thank you. I think this, you know, again, I really applaud Public Works' three-year contracts and what a great price because 175K is what we've been budgeting for this for at least two years. So thank you very much, Mr. Griffin. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say I'm super impressed when um, a department or uh, will say yeah and like own you know the the facts I guess or at least like at least you know if there's something supporting um, a hypothesis that you're that you're willing to like say yeah well I guess so I mean this is science you know it's not a perfect thing right so thank you very much for giving a straight answer for uh, uh, Ms. Mockler's question yes. Councilor Mockler's question. All right, that's all. No questions. <laughs> Any others? Folks good with consent for this item? Yes. All right, this will go on consent for next week. Thank, Thank you so much, Mr. Berthium. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, and next we'll move on as agreed to item B7. Your city attorney, Kylie Fennell, Fennell to present every time. Fennell. Fennell, Fennell, Fennell. Kylie Fennell to present interlocal agreement with Salish Behavioral Health Administrative Services Organization for the administration of opioid funds. And uh, Ms. Fennell, I know we also have some folks from the Salish Behavioral Health 
Administrative Services Organization with us here today sure. to uh, present. Happy to introduce them. We have Stephanie Lewis right here, and we have Jolene Crone, who are like to join me yeah. at the table. Um, they're from State English Behavioral Health Administrative Services Organization, and they have a PowerPoint to share with you to talk a little bit about what Salish is and um, <clears throat> why I'm recommending that the council um, approve this ILA. So if Wonderful. Take it away. All right. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here this evening and speak with you. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of information about our organization and then talk about our new role administering um, this region's allocation of opio opioid settlement funds. Next slide, please. So the Salish Behavioral Health Administrative Services Organization or Salish BHASO, was formed through an interlocal agreement between Kitsap, Jefferson, and Clallam counties and the Jamestown Clallam tribe. Of the seven tribal nations within our regional service area, the Jamestown Clallam tribe uh, volunteered to serve on our executive board and we wanted tribal representation on our government board. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So the current responsibilities of the Salish Behavioral Health Administrative Services Organization uh, is behavioral health crisis services as a primary, including mental health and substance use disorder for all residents within Kitsap, Jefferson, and Hualam counties, regardless of individual insurance status or income level. That does include a 24-7 toll-free crisis line, the Salish Regional Crisis Line that is provided to all of those residents, as well as 24-7 mobile crisis outreach and involuntary treatment investigations. In Kitsap County, that is provided by Kitsap Health, health Services, um, also known as the ECRs, um, but moving towards that mobile crisis outreach as a larger um, umbrella and spectrum of services. Um, we also provide for limited non-crisis behavioral health, uh, again, mental health and SUD services for low-income um, individuals, um, individuals that are referred to often as on or underinsured, so um, cannot afford even with insurance, some of those folks may uh, do not have insurance um, and are not eligible for Medicaid again. So uh, that includes outpatient uh, substance use treatment or mental health treatment, withdrawal management services, and inpatient for of mental health and substance use disorder treatment um, through such agencies as Kitsap Recovery Center, um, Pacific Hope and Recovery uh, here in Bremerton or just outside of Bremerton as well. Um, and we also do coordination across the region related to any challenges with that system. Um, we also administer several special non-Medicaid programs such as uh, the real teams that are available here now in Kitsap, Jefferson and Column 2 here in Kitsap specifically, Regape Unlimited and Western Treatment Center, uh, providing support to individuals with substance use and both uh, We also um, administer a behavioral health housing program that provides subsidies um, and services through um, the HARPS program, if you've heard of that, housing recovery through peer support, so peer support to assist individuals who are unhoused uh, from that through the process of being housed and maintaining. Um, with that, there's a lot of um, outreach. Uh, we also, one thing that didn't get on the slide, but I wanted to mention um, is we've been supporting our region with naloxone access, specifically related to overdose prevention, um, actually <coughs> for more than four years. Uh, we've been working in a partnership with the Department of Health and has been providing that um, to our providers across the region and the programs um, that we support. Um, and we also provide training to community and staff as well around behavioral health needs. Any examples possibly of where uh, council members may encounter real staff in the community? Uh, sure, the real team is fairly new, about 18 months now kind of in the rollout. Uh, they are doing direct outreach. Um, so they have been working um, with uh, sheriff, with um, city police, with uh, fire EMS, uh, they can be found assisting pre-encampment, um, doing some pre-encampment work, assisting those folks in trying to find um, other places to be. Um, they do some work at the Salvation Army uh, assisting folks. Um, it is a voluntary program that provides uh, support. It's intended to target those individuals who have not been successful in 
um, standard courses of treatment um, or access and services within the traditional model. Um, and it is a client-driven <coughs> program. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So briefly speaking to our new role related to opioid settlement funds, um, definitely don't want to veer too far into your lane. Um, but uh, just brief summary, an opioid settlement has been reached between the state of Washington and three opioid distributors. In addition, uh, participating local governments and the Washington Attorney General's Office have reached an agreement on the sharing of the settlement with 50% of these funds being allocated to the state and 50% to participating local governments. <coughs> The state is allocating the funds to local jurisdictions on our regional level, and Kitsap County is in the Olympic <clears throat> region, along with Clallam and Jefferson counties. For the settlement agreement, funding must only be used for approved opioid remediation uses, which are outlined in the settlement, with priority given to core abatement strategies. Next slide, please. An interlocal agreement was executed between Kitsap, Jefferson, and Clallam County uh, at the end of 2022, December 2022, which designated the Salish BHASO as the Olympic Region's Opioid Abatement Council. And this was in accordance with uh, what is called One Washington MOU, indicating that there has to be a regional abatement council in order for, for funds to be distributed. So the city of Bremerton may pool its funding with the greater Kitsap County allocation, or there's also an option for the city to manage the direct payments um, on its own. Local governments that opt to manage direct payments uh, agree to take on several actions. Uh, it's a list of several bullets, but I was trying to keep this slide brief. Uh, some examples would be establishing um, your own opioid abatement council, developing a methodology for obtaining proposals for the opioid funds, and ensuring there's an opportunity for community-based input on the priorities uh, for these uh, for programs and services funded by these uh, settlement dollars. Last comment is that we've heard from some cities uh, that they lacked sufficient infrastructure to manage these funds due to the limited administration allowance. So a maximum of 10% of the funds can be set aside for administration. And one thing I didn't note is that these funds are allocated at this point over a 17 year period. So while the total sum may sound like a lot when you stretch it over a long period of time, some folks don't think that there's necessarily a lot. So, and uh, the last slide is just my contact information and any questions that you may have. I have a few just high point facts. So for us, the allocation over 17 years is $66,578. Um, and so you think about the 10% of that can be allocated to administrative costs. It's under $7,000 a year. Um, and to kind of put it in a framework that you might be familiar with, because it sort of struck me as being like this, this, the, the framework is somewhat like LTAC. <clears throat> um, and so that you need to have this abatement council, you have to have a process to solicit our fees and you have to have a public process for awarding them. Um, we know what that process is like, um, and um, this is for a significantly smaller sum. Um, it also, uh, joining up with the, the, the other counties and um, gives us the ability to, to pull our resources and, and operate kind of on a regional level. And, you know, and, and maybe in doing so, kind of stretch that money some so that there's not um, so much going to the administrative cost. So, um, the as far as like the specifics of what you know what is this going to be going to they were able to tell you what we're doing now um and i think that you know it's still going to be bremerton dollars being spent in bremerton it's just not going to be us um doing the, the management of the um the process of soliciting bids and all of that kind of stuff excellent question <laughs> so such good timing because in our last public safety meeting, um, uh, these types of services were discussed 
uh, and typically get discussed at every public safety meeting. Um, and the, the need for data uh, around uh, what I would call a needs assessment and where the gaps are and all of that, um, I could see you all doing much better than if we were to try to do that um, because of a, we had great minds at that public safety committee meeting, including our two chiefs. And um, besides detox beds, um, you know, we could guess based on experience, but it's so nice to have that data. So I guess I'm asking, would that be a benefit of contracting with you all and, you know, uh, that we could uh, at some point retrieve data about right. uh, gaps in service. So in, in me looking at um, Salish, I came across that they did do a needs assessment just last year and it was published in December um, and it covered the tri county, mm -hmm. the, all three counties. Um, and um, so I think they're on the same page. So yeah. feel free to talk about that. I mean, yeah, I'm happy to expand if, if um, so yes, we did conduct a needs assessment uh, in 2022. Uh, we typically conduct a needs assessment every two years. Uh, it isn't specific to um, the opioid epidemic, but it doesn't exclude the opioid epidemic and, and needs of the community. Um, we are having discussions about conducting a needs assessment or at least surveying existing resources within Kitsap County relative to um, opioid addiction uh, prevention um, and then making a recommendation to the Kitsap Board of Commissioners on how to use funds. Uh, we haven't started that process yet um, and so I think that speaks to, to your question. Another benefit. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Michael, <clears throat> you guys work for Kitsap County. That is correct. Okay. And when was this uh, consortium or when was it formed? The original for our organization prior to speaking uh, about the opioid fund? Yes, I think so. Okay. So that there's a complicated answer to that question. Okay. So That's some like iteration of our current organization <laughs> has existed since the 19, late 80s. Late 80s. Okay. I was going to guess 87. Okay. Um, at that time, we were called the Peninsula Regional Support Network, okay. and we managed public mental health funding for the three-county region. There was an interlocal that still included the same service area. In 2016, there was a new iteration, the Salish Behavioral Health Organization, Salish BHO. We then began managing public substance use disorder funding. And then in January of 2020, the next iteration, there's a lot of change when it comes to healthcare. Um, we became the Salish Behavioral Health administrative services organization, always for three counties, always related to public funding. Um, just the scope has shifted a little over the, a lot over the last 35 years. Right. And then I think the last thing, I was wondering if you might um, just be able to give us, <clears throat> I don't know, some sort of idea of how these funds are going to make a difference in our community. Is that, I know that's very broad at bay, but um, I think it's hard to give a complete answer without having just a plan set yet for how the funds will be invested. I think one example, should um, that be where funds are invested, would be making the lock zone very accessible in the community um, so that individuals that either encounter someone um, that is experiencing an opioid overdose, they can administer a nasal spray and save someone's life. Uh, that's actually something we've been hearing a lot of from the real teams and the staff that are the agencies we contract with. Over the last six months, we've heard about at least a dozen people saved with naloxone. Um, yeah. And I only anticipate those numbers going up. So one example could be naloxone being very accessible um, and fewer people dying from opioid overdoses and there being an opportunity to engage individuals in treatment following um, such a, a traumatic experience. Right. Thank you. That was great. Okay. And remember, I know that you all saw those too on the documents. There's only like so much that this money can be spent on. It. There, it's very prescribed in the agreements. And when you read over it, it, none of it's bad stuff, right? I mean, it's all things that, um, you know, if, if there was enough money to go around, you would be doing all of these things. But um, 
it, it's not, I guess, for like, for free reign to spend our settlement funds in any way. You know, there's a list that whether we do it or whether they do it, there's only so many things that it can go toward. Um, and the nice thing about them doing it is that then they handle all of the administrative <laughs> work that goes along documenting how it was um, chosen, how wh which of those options was chosen, as well as how it's spent and following up on all of that. <clears throat> Jennifer, just because she had her hand, and then Eric. I'll refer to Eric. Sure. Yeah. So my question is, um, I want to say that the money that we're going to receive, this one million one hundred plus, is over a term of like seventeen, 17 years. years. It's going to be about sixty-six thousand dollars a year. Okay, sixty-six thousand a year. Um, so as far as impact. And that's great. It's better than nothing. Um, is this contract for 17 years? No. I don't um, see an end date or a big on the contract. Right. It's um, it's ongoing until it's terminated. And it, we have, a, I think, a 90-day or 60-day termination clause in there. I need to double check. I know that it was adjusted. Yeah. We worked on that with Jacqueline. Um, it, it, so if... Um, there's an expiration where if the, the organization ceases, it, it, it dissolves. Like basically there, the, the money has been distributed and there's no more reason for it than it expires on its own. Um, if we are unsat, the city's unsatisfied with um, the arrangement, there is a, an out for us. Okay, and then the overhead, if you will, is 10%. <clears throat> so $5,000 approximately a year goes to Salish Behavioral Health Administrative Services. Right, services. and and I, as you recall, there was an additional approval from council to enter into an additional um, settlement agreement for down the supply chain um, litigants. And so there will be additional settlement funds and this agreement covers that as well. So that, you know, an idea is basically with my pooling, there's more that can be done. So walk me through the process. We have approximately $45,000 left. How do you decide how that's being spent? Does the city of Brampton say, oh, we'd like um, the drug that you mentioned or whatever available, and you secure those services, or how does this work? Or you decide what's best? They're deciding. Okay. So basically, we're entitled to receive the money. We're, we're turning it over to them. To figure out how to use it. Experts. They're going to figure out how to use it. And then we're going to get a report back from you every year. Every year. This is what we used it. And there's only so many things that it can be used on. Right, so, as to do with the opioid. Right, and so um, the idea being that they'll do the needs assessments for on a regional basis. They'll figure out where it needs to go. Right. They'll do the contracts because they're not the, the, the providers. Um, you know, they're not going to be providing treatment services themselves. They might contract with a treatment provider if that's where the money is. Then. So you're doing this for kids at county? Are you doing it or anticipate doing it for the other cities in the county as well? We are in conversation with other cities, some and no other interlocal, to my knowledge, is yet to be signed, but there are similar conversations being had in other cities, such as Bainbridge um, Island and the city of uh, I, I really don't think this has a boundary, so it might as well be the entire Kisset County, right, in the city? I mean, it's, right now, it's, well, it's three counties. It's, um, right. Yeah, it's the, the Olympic region and then um, my understanding is that Paul's both decided to do their own. I do believe that is correct. Right. And so I think other cities are. <laughs> so that's still... interesting because uh, Paul's vote conceptually, you go by the city of the share, uh, they, they probably get 15000 a year. Right. <laughs> and Less. Okay. Whatever. All right. But, that's yeah. all I have. <laughs> Okay. okay. First of all, I'm trying to open up the website and it's, I'm not able to, I just kind of did a Google search. Can you direct me to your website for, I mean, it's yeah. a Kitsap Gov web, website. I just went to the search engine. I just went <clears throat> Salish BH ASO and it goes to Salish Behavioral Health Organization, Landing Home. Um, generally one below that. So a lot of times the old turn that up, right, is still the first thing that comes up on okay. Google. So Landing Home. 
So I'm going to just let that sit and ask you some questions, okay? And I'm um, happy, sorry to interrupt. No problem. Um, the actual address isn't easy to rattle off because there's right. several letters and numbers at the very end. I'd be happy to provide that this evening. Thanks. Um, so we talked about the real team um, and it's only been in, in place for 15 months. Have you been able to do an impact report with that? Um, um, so yet? we do have some data Mm -hmm. um, over the last two quarters, um, as we are working statewide. So the, the Recovery Navigator for our new statewide program, REAL, is our iteration of that. Um, we do provide reports to the healthcare authority, so there is um, data being collected and reports being made. So there's okay. specific information that you're interested in. They may be able to provide some of that. And can you tell me how you conducted your needs assessment? Um, did you use a continuum of care? Did you do um, an outreach directly to uh, impacted individuals? Um, we do both. So we share, um, so we created the document that could be done by paper. Somebody could call in, somebody could um, complete it online. Very simple process trying to um, <clears throat> provide direct access to any individuals. Uh, we work with our contracted network and all of our community partners and we send out to anybody who we have had a uh, coordination with, uh, including our criminal justice treatment account partners. Uh, so we're going to identify those individuals who are engaged in drug court to get input from those folks. Um, we've worked with NAMI. Uh, we've worked with um, social, so social service providers through the housing continuum. So um, we kind of send it out to anybody and everybody we have connection with and encourage um, additional support in expanding that. Yeah, I imagine that the, being boots on the ground with the real team would be the ones who would be gathering that assessment, you know, needs assessment. Because I just I think one thing that, that service organizations forget is not to use the continuum of care and to instead also, well, not instead, but in addition, mm -hmm. go directly to the people, to the impacted community and find out what they need. Um, and so, but I'd also know how surveys are hard to do. I did a survey um, uh, a while back and I was able to get a pretty good result with like 200 responses out of, but that was, it was a lot. I, like I sent out like 2000 um, and, but, and then like, you know, hand deliver to people and have the Google link and all of that. Um, but uh, again, I, I'd be curious to find out more if this, uh, if the needs assessment is, through the service organizations or, or how much of the, the data was gathered from the people that um, the real team come in contact with. And we do actually ask that question, how people, okay, how people identify, if they identify, um, and these are just a few <coughs> of the examples as a service provider, as a family member, as a participant, as an individual accessing services currently, uh, as an individual who has accessed services previously. So we do have that breakdown. Um, in the data that we collected because we also agreed that's important. Also, where did you find out about this? So we can identify those data. For our See, this website just isn't loading. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just like, let me just refresh and this and see if I've got an internet issue. Nope, I don't. Um, I'm just not able to load your website. Okay. So, so I'm gonna the whole county. The whole county's down? It was on the website like an hour ago, because we have a meeting in the morning. The whole I county is down. Very hard. Like an hour. I feel like this is rigged. <laughs> 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 it's a great title. Really? Okay. Well, so anyway, I'll just, I'll, I'll look at it another time. Um, and so I'm, I'm really curious about an impact report with the program so new to be putting so much, you know, I mean, I'm assuming some of the funding would go to the real team. Um, and, uh, I, you know, and, and so um, just to give you context, um, during the inclement weather season, I did uh, participate in doing um, outdoor meals every week. And so coming in contact with folks that are impacted, uh, some folks had, they have good positive connections with members of the real team. Some folks could not get a hold of them. So, uh, you know, uh, just, just some feedback. So that's why I'd, I'd love to see an impact report to, to see that data so I can really find out a little bit more about, you know, stats for the real team. Um, okay, a couple more questions. One of the questions is, I mean, you talked about naloxone availability. Can, um, I don't know if, if you might know this, are fentanyl strips legal to distribute? They're not. They're not, fentanyl strips are not legal. Are they test strips? 
story. It's it's fentanyl test strips. It's a thing. I just heard an NPR um, story about it a while back that in some places that fentanyl strips are considered contraband, and I don't know if they're legal in Washington State. You're saying no, they're not. So they are not easily available. Okay. Let's put it that way. I would love to see that become part of, I mean, if it's at all possible, if it's legal for fentanyl strips, since that's a new thing coming up, right? Um, going on. We want to talk about coming up. It's going on right now. Um, for that kind of availability. And um, the other question is, are you ready? Do you have the infrastructure to handle this? If you're in talks with other cities, you're going to, I mean, to have all the staffing shortages that are happening. Do you act, how can you it, how, speak to me about how you have the infrastructure to handle the incoming funding from other municipalities as well as ours? So I don't have concerns about infrastructure if other cities opt to pool. I don't think that significantly impacts administrative burden, especially if cities within Kitsap County are pooled within Kitsap County's allocation, um, you know, you know, distilling down how much of that money was in the city of Bremerton versus the city of Port Orchard. I'm not concerned at that point. Um, you know, you, you've got a great point. There's a lot of work and there aren't, there isn't more person power. Um, and we did, you know, we were thoughtful um, last summer when approached to be potentially the organization managing these funds regionally. Um, it makes sense to us. It aligns with a lot of the work we're already doing. We're finding opportunities for, you know, synergy when we were developing the needs assessment last summer. It was well prior to uh, us being named the Opioid Abatement Council, and we still found opportunities to ask more questions around opioids in the survey. So finding opportunities to really maximize, um, you know, our, our person power. I'm not concerned um, that we're going to hit kind of a, you know, a wall when it comes to bandwidth, um, but it, you know, it is, it is adding to our place. Thank you very much. Um, and just like for public, I mean, like just for the public, I was just taking a look at that 15% attorney fees. You're not getting that directly. No, no. Right? I know, I know, just for public record, if yeah, you want yeah. to explain that. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, um, so that is the, the total settlement, then you have that, um, the attorney's fees, and then you have allocation to the state, the allocation to the local governments. So there's a complicated formula based on like population and some other data that went into what your percentage was, then there's your allocation. Then you're ten percent. Then divided by seventeen, you get that. Yeah. So who? So who gets the fifteen percent attorney fees? Is it? The, I think it was Keller Rohrbach was the main firm for Washington. Who was it? Keller Rohrbach. Thank you. I believe it's the firm that I know it was representing the county. Um, I think there might have been another firm, but um, the litigation to get to the point where we um, started, like what seven years ago? I was going to say five, yeah. seven. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so they, um, of course, you know, front that cost the entire time. And um, we were not uh, on the, we were not early participants in the litigation, but the kids have counted out. Okay. Um, and when it got to a settlement, though, the way that that would have worked <laughs> is if one person got a settlement, everyone was going to jump on, right? And so I don't know if you, we were getting emails from the AG's <laughs> office who then had jumped in. Wanting to get that, you know, you see that one Washington MOU. They, we, they, Washington is like an entity had to get so much participation from local governments, a uh, threshold, but the settlement was going to fail. And so they met that threshold that they came forward and in the case you fall. Um, I'm going to ask just two more questions. I'm going to be devil's advocate and it'll be really, well, one of them will be quick. Um, uh, is do we have another? I mean, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Do we have any other options of an organization that could that could provide these services for our allocation? I don't know of any other organization. I think we could do it in house um, with 10% admin fees. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So I don't know of any other. Um, I mean, Salish is an unusual entity. It's it's kind of almost like a health district. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a statutorily created. Thing. It's not a nonprofit. It's not a you know corporation. It's a, a statutory entity, um, and I don't know anyone else who's doing this. Okay. So no, I don't know, and I don't know. I mean, I mean, I understand why it makes sense to have the same you know organization. And who knows what your name will be in seventeen years, right? You know, um, to have them do you know 
because the reason that that 10 percent it's not a lot of money but when you have a you know when you're doing it for a bunch of different municipalities right. and that's more bang for your buck i just uh, my concern is that we would lose um control and how this right, been, so, there right? so we will not we will no longer have a say in how this opioid money is spent we are trusting this organization that's something that we logically know and so um while I'm here, I just want to give you some feedback on a gap and maybe you can explore it. Um, so one of the gaps, and this is my last comment, I'll stop. Okay. Thank you for your, for your grace, graciousness here too. Um, so one of the gaps we have, well, you know, we don't have a medical detox facility on our peninsula. Uh, and that's a huge gap. People, we've been talking about it for years, right? Um, so no medical detox. We have, you know, regular, you know, like, regular detox facilities. So people, people get the two confused and I, you know, have sometimes. So I've reached out to a couple of my friends that are in the fields and drug and alcohol counselors. And I've said, you know, like, what are we going to do about the, you know, what, are, what do you think should happen? Or what do you, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And one gap that they mentioned is, well, we know that we need a medical detox facility, but we don't know how many people, like what's the justification for having one if there's not a lot of people? Well, that number is getting lost because let's say they call KCR you know, and, um, or KRC, sorry, wait, KMA. Yeah, K, KRC, <clears throat> KRC. And they say, um, I, I've, I've got an evaluation, I need a medical detox. And then that person says, oh, you got to go to Seattle. Well, they're not like ticking, right? They're not like keeping track of, I had five calls today. It's different people answering the phones. So somewhere along the way, people that do need medical detox are being like those numbers, there's not an easy way to count. So I just wanted to share that gap. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Nope, oh, excellent questions. We asked okay. due diligence on checking your phone. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry, yeah, totally. That would be great. So we have been really hearing that. Um, our data also, even when we were managing Medicaid funds, did not um, justify the number of individuals needing that level of service. We, however, continue to hear that as we've rolled out um, the real team in all three counties, the need for withdrawal management of all types has increased. Right. So those teams are now um, working to track where folks are going, okay. and they're taking out, whether it's subacute or medical. Right. Um, and that is an additional layer of data that they asked us to continue to, to support them in. So we have included that in our data that we, um, there's a, a set of data for the real team that goes to the state. We actually have added a few other, and that's one of them because we want to be able to identify what that really does look like, not anecdotally, but in, in the report. Right. We also have those conversations with KRC to also be collecting the same type of data so that there is continuity, so that we're very clear. Okay. I think we ended up with 27 data points, including what type, why they're defined, because often folks are defined for, you don't have the right substance on board, so you can't come to this ability. So, facility you your mental health is too high to come to this facility right so we are tracking some of those nuances to try to see what we can do to identify that gap to meet that data. okay so the real team is starting to collect that data but how are you going to get it at points like when people call krc or they call right. olala or wherever so you know in, um, in conversations with keith about how to take okay. over here krc to how to track that because awesome we started tracking some of that but it was like they called the this and they say I need it and they say no they, like you don't have that here just as you mentioned and we're like can we get more data from those folks thank yeah. you okay well that okay well i like your answer thank you <laughs> 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 i think um, on, on you, a, yes yeah i saw your you, you saw the question on it could you first hey, good evening Later. thank you for coming do you have any further questions vice president uh can you pass me the almonds yes <laughs> 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 um okay so I have a couple of questions. I was going to mention the lack of a medical detox, but Vice President Chamberlain took care of that real well. So one of the other things that we have been talking about with council for quite a while is the fact that we just don't have beds. Um, we have hired a uh, council authorized uh, behavioral navigator um, and there, you know, it's not like an, an absolutely utopian situation, but it's better. Um, and there simply aren't beds to put them in. I've talked to people at Kids at Mental Health, and it's the same thing. They can't <clears throat> reserve beds for people who, you know, aren't, you know, aren't there. You know, they can't just, even though it's pretty likely that they'll be there, they can't just set aside a bed. So I'm just wondering if 
beds are going to be a, a part of the infrastructure that you're going to be working on? That's my first question. So uh, lack of bed capacity is a statewide issue. That doesn't mean it's not important in the city of Bremerton, but it is a statewide issue. It has been for a while. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, uh, the problem um, only got worse. I think a lot of it has to do with the funding model in our state. Um, it's a statewide conversation with our legislature. Um, there are a lot of bills um, looking to address the issues with funding being at kind of the heart of why facilities are continuing to close down, even though the need in our communities is expanding. Um, at this point, I do not see um, increasing bed capacity as being something that likely can be accomplished with this type of funding. That doesn't mean it won't be evaluated. I just don't know if it is, you know, the, the cost of operating a facility 24 seven when bed capacity of that particular facility isn't constantly at 90%. That's why facilities are closing their doors. Um, we could look at other ways to make access to beds outside of the city and county potentially less of a barrier. Uh, I just don't see capital and building and bed expansion as being practical with these funds. Okay, well, then I'll just ask a follow up question, which is Has there been <clears throat> data on success rates where people have nowhere to lay their heads? There's definitely data about, you know, the inability to really achieve recovery when you don't know where you're going to lay your head at night. Yeah, there's definitely, yeah. Okay, so but this money is not enough to, to magic up a building. I don't believe so. It's not off the table. I just don't, I don't think it's correct, likely. Well, Lindsay <laughs> Heck. Okay, um, my second question is about the real team. Um, I, I don't have Vice President Chamberlain's first-hand knowledge of them, but it's basically, are they walking around and establishing long-term relationships with homeless communities? Unsheltered communities, I'm not sure of the right language. So I like to clarify that it is not um, a housing and homeless program. It is a substance use um, <coughs> occurring program, um, particularly targeted. It came actually out of the Blake decision related to uh, substance use and uh, criminality. Um, so individuals also should have some um, connection or interface with the legal system at some point. Many of the folks have ongoing, um, but they are the, the brief for the program is that they are spending 90% of their time in the community as the recovery coaches. So they are out there. Um, they are being called out in the middle of the night. Um, they are responding um, not just to law enforcement referral, which is the prime priority referral, but to community referrals. We have seen um, relationships with managers of the safe leg here in Denver who <laughs> calls them fairly frequently to assist with folks who are um, hanging out or staying in their parking lot that are needing assistance. We had one of the naloxone safe in that parking lot um, from one of our team members. So they definitely are out there um, and it, they are interested to be serving all of the county. So um, Agape does primarily primarily south, the line is the bridge and westbound treatment, um, the north end, but they do crossover based on um, need and individual choice. So they often also work together in that process. So they are out there in the encampments, in the community, on the street on a regular basis and developing those relationships. Okay, thank you. And then just to confirm, yours is a secular organization, right? We are a government entity. Thank you very much. <laughs> Eric? Yeah, just a follow-up question out of curiosity. So this <clears throat> is for opioid abatement. It's opioid settlement money. When I think of opioids, I think of pain medication with oxycodone. So let's walk through a mom or dad of a child that has uh, oxycodone issues and they want help. So this money's for can they can the parents call you and will they get help? So the parents can definitely call us um, and we can help navigate resources that are already available. I would think about uh, exploring whether or not the person has Medicaid, whether or not they have insurance, helping them navigate what is an often confusing system. Um, if there are not existing resources based upon their insurance status, then this could be funding to help pay for treatment. 
I think we want to make sure that other avenues, Medicaid, Primera, Medicare are looked at first. Um, but that is, you're right, that is what this money is for. Okay. Add to that? Yeah, and I would say as an entity, um, we do quite a bit of community coordination and resource and referral. Um, so we do um, get <clears throat> um, calls and connections with family. We are also rolling out a new program in the next couple of weeks called the Salish Youth Network Collaborative, which is intended to um, provide an additional layer of coordination for youth and families um, that have higher needs, complex behavioral health needs to be able to, um, it's in a multidisciplinary team model, which means pulling from um, participation from DCYF, from the Juvenile Rehab Administration if necessary, developmental disabilities, mental health, schools, and bringing all those folks to the table to provide support to those families and youth. I'll just say thank you so much for coming here to present to us and answer a lot of really great questions um, and, and clarification. And um, I was going to say earlier that the one I had was the due diligence on checking if we had other, just you know, organizations that could that could handle this. But um, personally, it sounds like you're doing fantastic work, um, and I think it'd be a great a great use of the money. And I'm glad to see we have an exit clause in case you know years go down the road and organizations have changed, city has changed, you know, there's an option there, but um, for now it seems good. Um, council, I'm tempted to put this on general business just to highlight the large sum of money and the, yeah. um, if, I don't know if you'd be available to come next week. To, Out of the 19th, it's the 19th. Okay, yeah, for Attorney Finnell, if you wanted to present for it, or, uh, yeah. I had, I, had another, I had another question, can we include mm -hmm. the PowerPoint in our packet? Sure, mm -hmm. I can absolutely do that. Okay. Um, good. It's, I think it's great timing, especially with 5536 passing both houses. Mm -hmm. Both houses? Mm -hmm. oh, I heard I heard one this morning. I've been out of the loop of it. Oh, it's all the check marks are okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, then yes, it is timely. If, and, if, and if I have follow up questions, I can email you directly. Absolutely. Okay. Because I think I still have a few, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let it That's go good. for now. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, we, okay. we got to move so, on. Yeah, I, <laughs> okay. I'm just, I, I, I will not know as much as mm -hmm. <laughs> these ladies about their organization. So I can certainly talk about the, the ILA more. But I guess what I'm saying is if yeah. you're putting it on general so that you can have this presentation public, they're not going to, they can't yeah, be there. They're not yeah. be there. So in that case, I'm well, consent. Yeah. What are you? What are you here's why I'd like it on general because I think that it would be worth it to offer this because a lot of people don't understand that a consent agenda includes, you know, like if I, I would love. can comment on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I think if there are, if there are, if there, if we give public more of an opportunity to have comment, I, I don't know. Do you, okay. do you know what I mean? It's more yeah. accessible. People understand it more when it's like a general business item. Mm -hmm. There's not a rush either. So if we want yeah. to. Look at schedules. Oh, look for. Yeah. And we don't have to always go to the exact next council meeting. Yeah, that's true. Two out or three, you know, whatever to see if if there's not a rush and if you yeah. we won't lose the money. Does anybody? Yeah. Are there two people who <laughs> want to take me back off? It's just okay. being. It's just going into an account right now. I turned my phone off just in case it went sure. over. So mm -hmm. and if the internet is, I'd be happy to coordinate to figure out which. Sure. So we would do that. Out. Like yeah, we'll do it offline. Okay. But if, if the consensus is good, there we'll happy to come back. Perfect. Okay. So we'll do general business at a future meeting and. I'll, I'll step out. We can coordinate and I'll put it on the next general. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Just coordinate with Lori. Either the first or the third, maybe next. Okay. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you all so much again. Really appreciate it. And thank you for all the work there as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Miss Lewis and Miss Prong. Mm -hmm. All right. So what time? Six o'clock? Okay. We we'll go to another item or two before break here. We'll keep an eye on the clock for like 6.30. Not even need lunch. <laughs> All right. We'll go back to regularly scheduled agenda. Next up is item B2, Professional Services Agreement with Confluence Engineering Group, LLC, for iron and manganese extended monitoring and treatment pre-design with Water Resources Manager, Cami Applebeck, and Environmental Technician, Lisa Campbell, here to present. Welcome both of you. <laughs> <laughs> first time, all right. Well, this is her first experience of presenting a contract okay. yeah. project. So, I'm environmental technician three for Um, I've been here for over a long time. I just haven't presented to council before. 
So I'm here to provide a summary of the Iron and Manganese Expanded Monitoring and Treatment Pre-Design Project to be completed by Confluence Engineering Group, LLC, through the Professional Services Agreement presented to you today for your approval. The City of Bremerton has experienced periodic customer complaints about discolored water and iron and manganese related operational challenges. In 2012, the City contracted with the Confluence Engineering Group to perform a desktop review of distribution system issues related to iron and manganese around the Anderson Creek Wellfield area. In 2020, this work was expanded system-wide and previous recommendations were augmented by identification of data gaps, collection of additional data, and a review of conditions within the water distribution system, source water quality, and operations and maintenance practices. This project builds on previous iron and manganese assessment and provides on-site pilot testing of selected treatment process to inform future treatment plant site selection and full-scale design. This project will also conduct chlorination breakpoint testing on ammonia observed at Anderson Creek Wellfield to ensure the utility is providing sufficient chlorination for disinfection. Lastly, the consultant will develop technical guidance on the implementation of routine monitoring within the distribution system to track and assess treatment efficacy. Confluence Engineering Group is a well-respected and experienced consultant in this area of work, and we're very pleased with their performance on previous projects. The budget for this project is $130,000 to be paid for by the Water Utility Operations Budget. No budget adjustments if necessary. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much. Council, despite your really strong feelings on agonies, go, go easy. <laughs> Uh, does this go through Public Works uh, Committee or? Okay, yeah, you want to summarize, Anna? Sure. Thank you, Division Manager Applebeck, for presenting about the iron and manganese. Um, I think this is a really good proactive. Um, Anderson Creek Wellfield, that's the only um, only wellfield that in which the uh, customer complaints about the discolored water have come from? No, we. So when we did our sampling, we discovered higher levels in our east side wells and Anderson Creek. So there's kind of problems in both areas, but uh, the east side was our priority because of the levels we found there. So. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to talk over the clock. <laughs> like the Oscars are getting paid. <laughs> 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 um, the iron and manganese that is present, it's, it's discoloring, it's, it's a little odd tasting, but is there any actual threat to health from either of these substances? Um, we, so there, they're not really regulated substances yet. They are secondary regulations for these, and I think that we said they are secondary standard for iron is a 0.3 milligram per liter and a 0 0.05 milligrams per liter for manganese, and a secondary, they're mostly aesthetic. Um, when I was looking them up, it, it kind of depends on the level. Like if you had a chronic high level that you were exposed to, you might start uh, experiencing a list of symptoms like neurological symptoms. Oh, no. um, it's like Parkinson's type symptoms, weak muscles, stuff like that. But uh, as far as iron goes, there are no known health effects on that. Um, so, are our levels approaching that? So to cl to to clarify that um, our the sources that we're measuring at our at our sources in our groundwater uh, surface water and uh, the the monitoring we do the routine monitoring within the water that's being delivered to your tap the levels are actually fairly low they are not you know they are not of a, a, a hazard to your health in any way what our concern is is that these materials tend to accumulate in our distribution pipes in the sediments that accumulate. So if we do have a high flow event, like during right. flushing, during a water main break, perhaps during firefighting, um, those can be resuspended. And we don't 
really have a good idea of what those concentrations are at those times. Intuitively, it tells us they're significantly higher. Could they be of, of a risk at that time? We think so, which is why we would like to, you know, if, for health reasons and also because it, it, uh, it uh, provides wear and tear on our equipment to our valves and whatnot. There are operational and health protection reasons to, to try to, um, to remove that loading of these materials into our system to begin with. So you're being proactive. Yep. You're responding to customer complaints and you're doing it for only 130 k. <laughs> This is so pre-design, right? <laughs> this, so this, so is, okay. <laughs> so this is uh, step three of the first the step, right? <laughs> before we, yeah, so they would do bench testing and modeling and then we would talk to the firm that manufactures the plant that we, we've uh, gone to other utilities and visited because our area is not the only area with this problem. So we visited and talked to also uh, about the plant that they have and learned a little bit about its maintenance and operations and the cost to maintain that. So, okay. And I, I'd like to equate this to the UV plant for those of you who uh, were here and were, uh, or were familiar with that process. It was really a boon to the city to have done their homework ahead of time. Um, and we, we were ready to go right to design and to con construction when the federal funds were available at the time. We want to be set up to be able to do something similar. Um, I won't say it always happens, but normally if EPA puts a new rule in place, which uh, based on the latest research of potential health impacts, we're anticipating there will be a rule. There will be uh, more um, uh, regulation over manganese in particular. Um, we want to be ready that if federal funding comes with that, that we're ready to take advantage of that federal funding to, to go right into design um, and then right to construction. Well, I would be delighted to geek out with you about this for, for much longer, but I feel it would try the patience of, my, of everyone else in the room. And you can email with any questions. Thank you. I, I will do that. I, no further questions for tonight. Thank you both very much. This is a great plan. Well carried in. Any other questions, comments on the, the character? So, uh, if you took the tour, we got to see the water treatment facility, the main one. I didn't realize there were additional ones. So you have other water treatment facilities, for example, on this map. Is that true? Next to the oh, what you're looking at is where we put chlorine, our hypochlorite injection location. I think you'll get into Anderson Creek. Sure, but so does this, does this water get then pumped up to the, your water treatment facility, or is this like no, treated and then it's treated. it goes into the distribution? That's groundwater. The only treatment the groundwater gets is chlorination for disinfection. It does not go to the UV plant for a ultraviolet. So the UV plant is just the surface water behind the side dam. Yes, the surface water treatment rule requires us to have two different forms of disinfection on surface waters, which is why we had to go to an additional UV plant. The uh, literature mentions chlorine levels for ammonia. Um, do you have concerns that you monitor the level of chlorine to make sure it doesn't have an adverse effect on copper pipes? All of that will be tested as part of this, uh, this breakpoint testing we talk about. We're going to answer the question, um, are we chlorinating sufficiently to provide the proper disinfection in the distribution system? Because what we know about ammonia, although the levels that are present are, are fairly low, we know that ammonia um, puts a high demand on chlorine. It uses, it eats, chemically eats chlorine, it consumes it. Um, and we want to make sure that the ammonia is not consuming too much of the chlorine we're putting into the system, leaving a short uh, of chlorine. So breakpoint testing literally is benchtop, benchtop testing with water on site. Um, and taking it, determining what is that breakpoint level whereby we've satisfied ammonia, it's happy now. Now whatever is left <laughs> is what we put is what we put into the system to disinfect for everything else. Um, and so it gives us that uh, magic number. Um, and we feel confident we are because we we are getting good residuals in our distribution system. It just behooves us knowing that ammonia is there, that we are accounting for that in our equations. So. This will allow us so to then the last question on this then is the uh, treatment with the UV at Cassad Dam, do you still put chlorine in, in yes. the water there? Yep. So everybody's yep. getting chlorinated water. Yep, that's correct. Have there been any complaints about the chlorination levels? 
Yeah. On occasion, we get those calls. And and what's the basis of those complaints? So like I can taste chlorine, or is it affecting yes. my pipes, or what's um, the... Never, I've never heard that. I often turn out and feel taken walk samples a lot to hear customer questions. Um, there's certain times of the year where they say it smells like chlorine or they taste like chlorine. Okay. I can say that as part of the uh, corrosion control testing that we do. Um, uh, for lead and copper. We, we test both for lead and copper in the distribution system, and uh, our copper levels have been very, very low. Now, what's happening in someone's personal plumbing might be completely different, mm -hmm. but we have not, the only falls I recall getting, and they're not that many, it's those people who just, I don't know, they're just gifted, I guess, with a very fine uh, palate <laughs> uh, and ability to taste uh, elements, and, and so they can, they can taste the chlorine. Um, and they'll sometimes call us and say, did you up your dosage? Because mm. <laughs> it seems to be, you know, we can mm. taste it more now. Um, and usually, you know, that that's a very temporary situation. Very easily solved by as Lisa uh, provides information to them. Just let it sit for a minute. It, it uh, chlorine is a very it um, volatilizes. volatile <laughs> chemical, it will quickly evaporate. Um, and so, yes, you know, use the cold water and let it sit for a minute and, and the taste goes away. Mm -hmm. I, I lied. I have one other question. Mm -hmm. So Lisa <laughs> and Cammy, Lisa, this is what you do is you go around and test water. Yes. Is the scope of this project so huge that you can't do that or does it require special whatever testing equipment that the city doesn't have? Why do we have to go to contract for this and not do it in-house? Oh, we don't have enough to do. No. <laughs> um, it's not that we <laughs> Frankly, I don't know that much about iron and manganese. I'm calling in a consultant to do all the benchtop testing and all the pilot testing, and and I, I don't have enough knowledge to design a system for us to install. Okay, so that, that this is also the designing of the system, and not the testing. They come design. with the technical expertise. They're uh, chemists, they're engineers. They come. Okay. They actually bring uh, for the for the um, pilot testing for treatment for manganese removal. They literally bring a mobile unit to the site and set it up and run it for 48 hours, directly pulling the water from our system, running it through these uh, filter medias and they're testing for efficacy. And and, and uh, that's beyond uh, what internally we do. Um, and I appreciate your question though, because Lisa is extremely busy. Um, and it seems like there's always a new rule and more monitoring that we're required mm -hmm. to do. And she has, uh, in my eyes, it seems seamlessly taken it on. I'm sure she's biting at the bit. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, so it's, there is testing we do to support these efforts. A lot of that, like uh, just yesterday, she was out with our distribution crew. They were cleaning the large transmission main from the surface water system up to um, halfway to the Kitsap Lake area. That's one of those pipes that we have sedimentation buildup in. Um, they were cleaning that and we were doing pulling samples and testing throughout that process to make sure that we were sufficient. How long does it take to clean? How many runs do we need to do to make sure we remove that material? So a lot of that extra testing she has taken on or that extra sampling, but we've got great, the distribution crew is always helpful. Even some of our other operators will step up and, and help her out because sometimes you just need four pairs of hands. That's the reality. Um, but our city staff is excellent in they have a very much a, a team investment and a team mentality and they step out and help. And one of our operators, Forrest, who is a genius with, uh, with uh, designing um, apparatus, designed a sampling apparatus that we were able to put on the hydrant. He did that all in house uh, to, to sample. So yeah. <laughs> I keep telling him he should. He could um, put his kids through college on it. <laughs> But that's a fun video to watch when they're taking our transmission main. They put a giant foam swab into an 18-inch pipe, and so which we call a pig. So if you hear us yeah. saying pig, and that's <laughs> well, we don't. I mean, the industry calls it a pig, yeah. and if you hear the term pigging, that's basically a pig, like foam pillow or foam bullet being pushed through the system to scrub out the interior of the pipe. Learned that on our last tour. Yeah. I really love watching the two of you present this. <laughs> if I, I, I mean, it felt like you were teaching us. We were all pretty engaged. I understood everything you were saying. Um, 
And then, you know, Council Member uh, Younger asked you a, a very challenging question, a uh, very appropriate but challenging question. And man, you just sat there <laughs> and, and said, you know what? I don't know what you would, I don't know that much about magnesium and, you know, and I find it absolutely refreshing and um, uh, really engaging. So good job on your first uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, that's it. I don't have a question. I'm just <laughs> go team. <laughs> so much excitement about this. It made me excited. It's the yeah. water. It's the mm -hmm. We have a great water. water. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 I was going to say, I had a teacher once who was talking about electrons being in a happy place, not a happy place. So, yeah, they're happy you're here. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, it's a good. So, um, no, so I appreciate your presentation. Um, yeah, I, just, I just appreciate uh, getting ahead of this. We'll brag about Bremerton has the best water and the cheapest water. Um, so, I appreciate all the efforts to keep it there. Um, Council, any objections to consent? Sure. All right, this will be on consent for next week. Thank you both so much again. Thank you. Yeah. Water presentation. What is your right. name? Was that a dad joke? It was really metal. You try. Yeah. <laughs> your email is <laughs> so All right. See, we keep going. If folks starting to break, let me know. Um, next up, we'll go to items B3 and B4, starting with item B3, agreement with SCJ Alliance for Construction Management Services for the Washington Avenue and 11th Street Roundabout Project. And we have Engineering Project Manager Nick Atai here to present. You, welcome, Mr. Atai. I had a presentation. Excellent. Figure this technology out. Well, thank you so much. Uh, happy to be here this evening. This is uh, actually a pretty exciting milestone for the Washington 11th project. It's uh, It's been a project that uh, it's been quite a journey to get here, and, and we're excited to, to get this underway. Um, this particular item is for construction management services. So I thought I'd give a little bit of a uh, brief update on the, uh, the, the project itself, and then talk to the construction services. So um, on your screen, I'm showing the, the limits of the project, uh, starting from the west end of the Manette Bridge, uh, working north and west. Uh, Pacific uh, project is uh, full pavement reconstruction. Uh, we obviously uh, have the conversion of the signal to the west end of the bridge roundabout, uh, sidewalks and bike lanes, continuation of the, the complete streets, modal uh, initiatives. We have a uh, reconstruction of sidewalks, uh, crew parking on the lower Washington uh, residential section, uh, street lighting, street trees, landscaping. Uh, obviously, the, the underground infrastructure that comes with that storm drainage facility and some minor water main improvements. Uh, I've got some, some sections there. Um, all this information is on the project website, uh, keeping that website up to date as we move uh, forward to the construction. Uh, the upper left of this slide shows kind of the overall schedule uh, for the project. I've got a red star kind of where we are now. We are in that uh, gray area for agency approval as we work towards authorization for construction. Uh, we will be uh, bidding hopefully in the next month. Uh, the project does have both state and federal funding. Um, and as a matter of fact, 73% of the funding uh, is coming from those sources. So, Pretty exciting to see a project in the scale of the funding part of There is some ARPA funding in this project. Uh, I say that because the construction management services are uh, eligible for, uh, partially eligible for those services uh, and those, those funding uh, revenue sources. And uh, wanted to talk through what are we uh, including in this construction management contract. So. Uh, construction management services are, are probably one of the most important things we can do to set a project up for success and, construct, and into construction. Uh, and that's uh, especially true for a project that has federal funding. Uh, so the requirements, the paperwork, uh, you know, 
know, the back checking for federally funded projects is pretty significant, obviously much more intensive than, um, you know, unfortunately our staff here allows us to do. Um, again, we're fortunate to have the, the grant funding on this project to help support those costs. Uh, this contract is going to provide about two and a half um, full-time staff over the life of construction. That includes a full-time construction inspector, a full-time resident engineer, and a part-time document specialist. Um, I've listed a few of the, the key um, aspects of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, uh, construction inspectors out there uh, ensuring that the contractor uh, is, is uh, installing the improvements uh, for the for the requirements of the, the plans and specifications. Uh, the resident engineer is kind of acting like an extension of our staff and as a liaison between um, you know, the contractor, our staff, the inspector, making sure that we keep things moving forward, uh, fact checking paperwork, uh, communicating with uh, our staff on, on major decisions. And then obviously documentation is a major component of, of the project. So uh, they do have someone that is keeping uh, uh, keeping up with the documentation uh, in the event that we get audited, uh, we have uh, the documentation forced to get reimbursed uh, for the funds. Um, also included in this contract is construction materials testing. So those are services to make sure the actual construction materials uh, requirements. And then we do have some uh, minor funding for public outreach support. Uh, because of the traffic control that can be associated with this project, uh, you know, coming up with some readily uh, or easily um, understood graphics, um, you know, just different ways of communicating with the residents can be very important. Uh, this um, contract is with STJ Alliance. Uh, they were selected under a previous request for proposals. Um, we negotiated a, a, a contract with them. It includes about 3,500 hours support services in the construction phase. Um, I did want to note that there is a small typo on the agenda bill that we will correct for next week. Uh, it's a, a difference of a, a few hundred dollars. Um, the amount on the presentation is correct. We'll get that updated. Um, but with that, I am happy to answer any questions. I know it's affecting that pretty quickly. I want to make sure I was able to answer any questions. Yeah. Anybody catch the typo ahead of time? Uh, Eric? Okay. No, I'm disappointed yeah. in you. <laughs> no, but I'm waiting for the dad joke. I'll get to my question in a roundabout way. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, God, okay. 965, right. not 438. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, we'll appreciate the heads up on that one. Okay, so what's that to be picked? Um, and I'm assuming this went through Public Works. I know. I just got previous. Did this specific contract go through? Uh, in January, okay. mid January. In the January meeting. Okay. Uh, yes. Any questions, comments, Michael? I think you kind of said this, but I just want to clarify the very beginning. Uh, so SCJ, we we've contracted with them before and had a good track record with them. Yeah, and actually, they are uh, providing construction management services in the net on the mm -hmm. job. They're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Obviously, another complex project. So I think we've heard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the, the businesses and residents there, just, you know, obviously having a good, a good contractor helps the mm -hmm. uh, having a good CM that can, that can proactively address the great mm -hmm. Uh Was anybody, anybody here in public works uh, in 2006, 2007? Anybody? Um, I didn't realize that this stretch down to the end of, of uh, Washington Avenue, if you need another mural, at the end of that block, I'm happy to help. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. <laughs> all right. It's mural. Yeah. Let's be you, nobody else would know what I'm talking about. All right. <laughs> a little history of this. Um, <laughs> there, was, there was debate whether we should have had a roundabout a long, long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. There's a council member, Jerry McDonald, that was pushing for it for years. So, I don't hope this. I want to reach out to Jerry and let him know that I see he's on the Facebook. So I think he's still around. I know. Oh, yeah. He's still around. Let him know he's finally getting around about. That would be nice. You should name it for him. Well, I was going to throw that out there, but uh, whatever. I don't I don't believe in that for people that are still alive. But um, we're going out for bid. So 
we don't know what this is going to cost. But usually, it's, can you help me out? Nick? What do you think this thing is going to cost in the end? So, What's your uh, engineer estimate? Yeah, so we're, we're just over $6 million. Um, obviously, you know, we're just like the rest of the industry, we're seeing uh, prices across the board go up. Uh, you know, that's uh, uh, it's <coughs> several factors that go into pricing. I mean, we're, that's why we're uh, so eager to use it under construction right now. It's, it's getting to be, uh, you know, probably the peak time for, for you know, a lot of work in this situation to be underway. So we want to make sure that we're um, not bidding to an extent that, you know, contractors already have a pretty good backlog. They aren't as uh, hungry for that's kind of where we sit right now. And, and, you know, uh, we budgeted for what our estimated costs are. And, All right. and, uh, we'll find out in you know, coming months. So if the bid's way too high, then this uh, contract becomes no? Mm -hmm. uh, no. So if the uh, bid's too high, yeah, there's obviously, you know, uh, termination clause in the contract. So. There's no nothing to manage if you know, for what, you know whatever reason they'll pull the construction contract. So I think that's a highly unlikely situation. Sure. No. Perfect. Now for the speed of my go. Oh, sorry. Huh? No. Yeah. No worries. Um, I'd just like to thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Yes, it was. Um, I guess I'm, I'm looking at this and a communications manager and for public outreach, that's something that's on council's goals and priorities. Um, a documentation specialist, that is something that if we had infinite money and a, a pool, huge pool of qualified applicants, public works would already have, yes? Yeah, so we have uh, we have project assistants. Um, obviously their, their roles are very broad. Um, yeah. When I say documentation specialist for the construction management it's world, it's, uh, it's really a matter of understanding, um, you know, we're following, you know, uh, Washadot's specs. Um, so following someone that's familiar with their, uh, their requirements and how those forms get yeah. administered and, yeah. and filed and, and reviewed and make sure again, yeah. you know, for the, the reimbursement of these purposes. So, there's a full-time resident engineer and there is a full-time construction inspector. Materials testing, I've, I've been told, is something you typically want to have someone else do. Yes, yes. Yeah. You have uh, so, you know, certification for uh, yeah. specialized equipment. Yeah. So here we have several positions that um, if you guys, well, if, if you'd like to, you can look at the consultant billing rate schedule Exhibit D2, like for the senior engineer, they're getting it's the direct labor rate is 6006 after allowable overhead of almost 152 percent, negotiated profit of 31 percent. These are all totally fair, totally fair add ons. The total hourly billing rate for this is just, just not behaving itself for a senior engineer goes from 6006 to the direct rate to um, 169.95. Um, this I think is a really good argument for um, budgeting for public works employees, I guess is my point that I'm drilling home. Um, this is gonna be 32 weeks, All right, I've finished drilling at home, okay. Um, this is gonna be 32 weeks plus two weeks startup, that's what you're budgeting, that's the time budget. Well, day uh, working day project and obviously there's some um, effort that happens prior to the contractor actually starting to work the middle. Yeah, I'm just and pulling it straight from, yeah, so yeah. 160 hours, 160 days, that's 100, 32 yeah. weeks now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and what's the, how many feet, how many linear feet is this? How many linear feet? More, uh, more or less, or, or square footage. It's kind of hard because okay, know, the project's mind. got, you know, the intersection and the kind of the offshoot of the residential Washington. Um, I'm not, I could get you that information. I could like get a scale and go measure it my own self. I was just wondering if you had it. it. It's not that big a deal. 
Um, I know that there seems council Everybody seems to really enjoy this project, and it's good luck on um, these figures are from April 2022. Um, the billing rate table. Yes. So, and they're going to stick to them. Yes. So the uh, the the rates are uh, obviously their overhead negotiated. That's yeah. audited. Uh, and then their rec rates are, are listed in here. Uh, you know, they do have, um, you know, um, the ability, there's a, a called the Hansen table. So that is exhibit B2. Yeah, that's the one I'm looking at. Okay, so that's um, that's the, uh, again, this it all yeah. goes through their audited wash off rate. No, no, I'm just commenting that yeah. well done, you guys, if you can get them to stick to figures that oh, are yeah. a year old. Yeah. But you're exactly right. I mean, the, the cost of construction going up, the cost of uh, consultants are going up, it's cost of the Certainly, you're cognizant of that as well. It would be nice to be able to do some of this in-house. Oh, wait, I said I was done on that point. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my tongue slipped. I'm all done. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm just so, yeah, I... I, should, I shouldn't have made that joke so early about the mural because I do have a question. Um, <laughs> but um, now what's different about that block from when I lived there is that there's a little extra parking that's been kind of carved out across the street. But I'm curious about the parking situation for folks when the improvements begin to happen on that lower Washington Ave. What's going to happen with, because that's a, a, a real tight place. No, almost nobody has a driveway to pull into on that block. So. There's, there's a, one property that has the, uh, the ramps Kind of interesting oh yeah they do don't they it's weird i don't know how that that's even like permitted or it might be grandfathered in but it's it's weird yeah so that's going to be the uh, the first uh section of the construction um you know the thought is you know we're going to be doing the sidewalk and the street so uh the sidewalk right. work is going to probably happen first we're improving some drainage mm -hmm. through there and then we're going to move to the street the thought being that maybe that can be done in segments you have the parking on the Mainline Washington area that can be utilized. Right. Uh, We're trying to set the expectation that you know it's going to be it's going to be a painful you know few weeks when the contractors kind of work their way through that area. Um, but you know I think all the residents have been understanding and know that you know there's going to be a place to park. It's not going to be directly in front of the property. Yeah. How how will walking be inhibited for folks? And actually what I do know about that block too, um, at least there's one on that specific block, there's one um, uh, kind of a group residence. I don't really want to call out what it is, but um, there's a group residence that's on that block. Um, but there's, I'm just wondering how walking will be inhibited. It, it is a main throughway, so. Yeah, so um, generally, I mean, just the same kind of the efforts that are happening in the net right now. You know, you're gonna have sections of sidewalk closures. Um, you know, again, it just, it's just okay. it's for safety, um, you know, to make sure that the folks don't walk into the construction zone, that there's gonna be detours, um, you know, there's gonna be a pedestrian route provided, you know, it may just be kind of a, a detour around that residential area while they're working, et cetera. And again, that's just for uh, the safety of, of so there's going to be any, I mean, I'm guessing from what I know about that block, um, about 30 cars, I mean, 25, was that rough estimate about how many cars are going to be diverted into the other parking spots? And I, there, again, you are right. There is parking across the street that's underutilized over by the retaining wall, but not 20 or 30 spots. Yeah. So it will be, uh, I mean, it's going to be, um, you know, the spots that are underutilized right now will be fully utilized and we'll have to figure out some way to make sure um, that, you know, we're monitoring that. If there are parking issues and, you know, we can signing or maybe temporary permits or something, yeah. we'll have to figure out. Um, can they get, it. can they get, a, I mean, is the city of Bremerton um, permit, like the parking tag, can that, is that block specific still or is it, it's still block specific so that they can go and maybe get a different kind of sticker if they have that kind of a, they do that. Perhaps, I'm not okay. All right. Uh, That's it. Thank you. Just some uh, people that know what that means. We'll look into I that. It was two blocks because we're flying out mine. It's, it's really rough. 
Rodish. for two blocks. Same. Rodish. No. Well, because yeah. they're talking about 11th yeah, Street Place and Lower Washington Ave. Right. Okay. Um, oh, there you are, Miss yeah. Monroe. You're right back, back there. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, don't know, I think that they can that this will pick you up. If they can pick up the bells from outside, I'm sure it can pick you up from the back of the room. But yeah. we'll try it. Um, yeah, it is um, so actually, they already reviewed this a bit, and uh, and we it comes from the community. Actually, so, actually, the area that is part of the river down on the island, the river down, everything park, and up the top of the Okay. And there is still going to be actually walking. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, they're all. <clears throat> yeah, no, I appreciate. I know it's just a small amount of people that are impacted, but I still felt like it was important to make sure that they're being taken care of. Yeah, um, i wrap this one up here. Uh, like I say, I, I got to think of me before, before being sworn in, I was talking to neighbors and public works and I keep saying big kudos to public works in the project because of the early and active outreach that they did to all the, the neighbors along that street um, and there was input on the design of the street there was discussion about the parking spaces the number of parking spaces neighbors had their own count public works did a nice study looking at you know how many were actually being used um, so I, I feel really confident that that all of the citizen input in this case has really been taken into account and um, kudos to Mr. Atai and really the great outreach and project flyers so um, I've shared some of them and they just uh, they just some of the project status really nice see all the contact information so that's fantastic on this contract um i just want to make sure i got it right uh specifically there'll be um door flyers and some ongoing outreach through the consultant through sjc to notify folks of once the construction occurs yeah the very outreach. so the the public outreach component is very limited uh, in this contract again that's balancing you know what we thought we've got people in the house um, you know, we're dealing with contractors, so it's, you know, it's, uh, making things look pretty in a way that, you know, sometimes it's good to Good deal. No, I think this is uh, in a great place, so, um, anyone have any objection to consent for this contract? Yeah. All right, let's go on consent for next week. Thank you. And if folks are good, maybe we'll do the next item, um, Mr. Atai's on that one as well, and then we'll take a break. Perfect. All right. So next up, we have item B4, sure. contract with Institute Foreign <laughs> Technologies, LLC, for the 2023 sewer rehabilitation project. All right. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Council. Uh, yeah, kind of a weird transition from uh, Washington to uh, sewer rehabilitation. Uh, I've got a very quick presentation on this one. All right, so this is for the uh, 2023 sewer rehabilitation project. Um, this was before the committee uh, February 16th. Uh, the item will be a contract with Fishing Point Technologies. So, a uh, quick overview of um, period in place pipe. You're going to hear us talk about CIPP. Um, it's actually where you um, install a liner, a structural liner inside of an existing pipe. You're basically creating a new pipe, an existing pipe. Uh, really uh, interesting process, a lot of evolving technologies, um, but I just kind of wanted to outline kind of how that happens. We have a company come in and under this contract, we'll do a cleaning and inspection. Again, as a verification that the, the line is ready to be uh, lined. Uh, and if any repairs are needed, they'll, they'll address those minor repairs to coordination with us. Um, obviously, while they're doing the work, they have to bypass flows. That's a whole uh, component of the, the lining process. Um, you have the uh, actual lining process, which is very interesting, where you're taking the liner, you know, putting, um, um, you know, the, the material in there, curing it, inverting it, and then uh, using uh, heat to uh, cure the pipe. And then your uh, three. Uh, and stating the, the services going into the pipe and then kind of doing everything backwards, getting that back in place. So it's a really neat process, very cost effective. Uh, sounds like the city's been doing uh, this type of work for quite a while. So. 
Uh, this particular project has about 8,000 linear feet of sanitary sewer pipeline uh, and about 3,500 linear feet of uh, storm sewer pipeline. Uh, about 240 uh, laterals will be uh, impacted and, and reinstated um, with this, this project. Um, when I um, talk about protruding laterals, that's where we've got uh, service coming in that's kind of sticking into the pipe. Uh, that's going to be addressed uh, as part of the video inspection process prior to line. And then also, uh, the, the contract's going to get us ahead on our next year's contract by doing uh, an inspection on about 1,500 linear feet of sanitary sewer. So we're here at the next, next uh, year's project. Um, got a map here showing the, uh, the locations. Project will be 135 calendar days, and uh, bids were open March 29th. Got two responsive bids. Uh, again, in future forms technology says the the, uh, the the most qualified lowest bid. Uh, so this item again is for approval of the contract with the future forms technologies. Happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Questions, comments. I have a technology question. Sure. So Nick, I understand that the uh, you do the Karen line, and, and it's basically lines the whole pipe. You've got the laterals coming in, so a little robot, if you will, I'm not joking, comes in, <laughs> does the cutout to, to get in it. So when you have a protruding, so you got a pipe that's apparently going into the main line, it's in the way. How do you cut that pipe? You do similar, the same similar thing. Uh, you have a, a specialized uh, routing tool that can get in there and. It's done remotely because the pipe's too small for someone to. Yeah. So, and that's and that's another reason I know. Uh, you know, there's some of the larger cities have the capacity to do this stuff in house. Mm -hmm. You know, I know we've got the capacity to do shorter segments, smaller or the pipes. smaller pipes. Yeah, we can do the smaller service laterals. Yeah, it's, and this is an evolving industry. I mean, uh, even in city form, they've got you know new technology that they're. You know, wanting to introduce us to a console and provide you know, even more cost savings for uh, future contracts. So, okay. you guys ever do videos of this, the whole process? You can see a little robot do this whole thing. Uh, I'm sure we have. Maybe put a please. You put a GoPro on it. Yeah, we can. Uh, I think that would be. You know, we can definitely. Information together, maybe interesting, maybe even for the next uh, update, kind of share problems that we need to do. Any other questions, comments? The only one I got is, and it's open. Okay. okay, you could go first. I could, I usually grab it. You like to go last. Okay. <laughs> procedure, just our, just our custom. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm going. Um, so you're doing 11,500 linear feet of this. Well done. That's like a big jump over last year. Um, I was just wondering how you chose the locations. Uh, so the locations, again, their coordination with, with operations. I mean, these are uh, names that have um, known issues or you know, structurally these are these of concrete or, you know, where there's a serviceable life on the pipe, so try to get ahead of it. If the pipe becomes too deteriorated, then you can lose the ability to line it. So, you know, trying to identify the right opportunity to like find these lines. You know, it's going to last another 50 to 60 years once the line goes in. And in homage to Leslie Dogs, you're going to go around and, and let people know that this work is, is happening and you'll be hanging door knockers and informing people of work hours. Thank you. Michael. Um, uh, kind of related to that is uh, what, what does the disruption of traffic look like and, and or to residents? Do they lose? Is there a window that they aren't supposed to be using their sewer? Yeah, so the, that's part of the notification process. Um, I mean, when you think about the, the time frame, you know, uh, you're trying to do the work when there's the lowest amount of flow, so can run this area all the time but during the day. Uh, we do have a couple of corridors that, that vehicle traffic. You know, we put a requirement in there for nighttime work, uh, you know, just to make sure that we're reducing impacts to the vehicular traffic. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, a lot of that's communicated. Uh, you know, a lot of that is the contractors that 
form. You know, this is the type of work they do. Is they're very good at monitoring uh, things and making sure they're communicating uh, and being kind of prepared if, if something does come up. So, yeah, they're 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 getting this work done in a, a kind of a Almost like an assembly line operation, right. whereas they're doing the line, you know, it's ready to be cured. They can kind of cut a simply opening and restore that service. So Great. It's, it's very, very fast and very uh, minimally impactful. That's really the, the beauty in the fact that this technology, because the alternative is open text construction. Right. Um, you know, that's very, very disruptive. Yeah, that makes sense. That was part of the question. So we expect most of this or all of this to be through sort of existing access uh, yes um, covers and you know what are they called now yeah, oops i can't say that i'm sorry i think it's outdated but it goes manhole, manhole to manhole right <laughs> it goes manhole to manhole and then if you don't have redundant pipe you would have a vector charger that would pick up the uh, flowing so you could do the cure in place uh, right so the yeah you'll have two access points yeah two manholes and then you know they'll have to you know, depending on the situation you know they they insert the liner in from from one side and kind of gets inverted through the, the pipe to the other side yeah. and then they'll, they'll do the curing process yeah. i think yeah videos would be great so next time i'll come prepare the video Sorry, just really quick follow up. Just to, um, and one of the reasons the price was um, higher the last time council looked at this contract was that you were using a, a different chemical to cure the pipes because someone had complained about the odor. Am I completely off base on that? Uh, no, so there are different types of um, resin. Um, so there's a, there's what's called a pyrated resin, you know, kind of like the older uh, that's been around for, for a while. Um, so that is something that you know it can cause um, you know you can get complaints um, there's obviously you know you know the, the most immediate risk are the the workers that are exposed but you know even the styrenated um, products are you know they they test it to make sure that they're within the, the level necessary this contract did not allow styrenated resin to be fired degree um and Moving forward, you're going to probably hear us talk more about UV cured, where they're curing um, liner with UV light instead of thermal. So that's becoming, you know, more uh, you know, uh, more of a common way to cure this. And again, industry is changing, technology is changing. Thank you. And uh, sorry if I missed it. Institute form. Have we worked with them before? Yes, we are. Okay, cool. No issues. Not a question I got. Yeah. Uh, Excellent. No, such really cool technology. It's, uh, it's fantastic how things are progressing. So, uh, Council, everyone go to consent? Yep. Yes. yes. Perfect. All right. So, go to consent for next week. And uh, just a quick note because I saw Lori's message online that the microphones are extra sensitive. So, even if folks are like whispering across the room, they might be picked up. So, just a, just a heads up as we address the technology. Yeah, exactly. You're in the back, yeah. so yeah. Whisper in French. Well, if you whisper in French, then you know, maybe. <laughs> that's a dead language, right? Okay. No, no. All right, well, that's it. We're getting silly. How about we do a 10 minute break? We can do yeah, yeah, seven yes. or we can be at seven o'clock. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. 702, call the meeting back to order. And next up, we've got item B5, contract administrator Melinda Monroe is here to present agreement number seven to Imperial Parking LLC in park, parking enforcement and management services agreement. Take it away, Ms. Monroe. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to be here uh, to present a two year six month extension to our current agreement. Uh, the purpose of this amendment really is to make administrative uh, updates, align current and planned service and expectations with our contract terms. And also, we just set the parking enforcement up to meet the recommendations of the JCPP. So the other item that I'm really excited about, or the, or the main item, I'm really excited about it in this update is the inclusion of our electric low speed vehicle for service in the downtown core and city lots. Um, and also we've added some definitions to the agreement um, that I think will align with our, our actual expected uh, enforcement. And finally, uh, this budget amendment, or this amendment is within our current state budget. Um, and from all additional, uh, all available uh, sources, it really is competitive pricing structure. Um, I did inquire if we could um, send this pricing as it is out, um, and that really would not probably work. Um, but um, I do have additional data on that. It's for you as a question, but I will say that I believe this is a very competitive structure, pricing structure. Um, and, um, you know, this group, they often do not get the uh, kudos or the recognition for all that they do. Um, they actually enforce it across different, six different zones. Um, I would say that each one of those zones are equivalent to at least the downtown core in need. Um, they can't give each one of those zones the same time. Um, just they simply do not have enough time in the day. Um, and um, parking enforcement is something that is, um, I think we've equated it to whack-a-mole. And it is a lot like an endless, endless game of whack-a-mole. And it's not just one area, but it's also huge. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, you could go down the street and you could find parking violations in 80% of the vehicles that are parked there, if you just looked, uh, you enforced every law that was there. So um, I can get past about that. So I'm really excited about this uh, amendment. It adds more efficiency, especially the use of the, the local vehicle in the downtown core. Um, I'm excited to see that team being able to use that versus walking. Um, and I think that's everything. That's your question. Good question, comments, yeah. Okay, so uh, Ms. Monroe brought this to our uh, Park Investment and Finance meeting. And it, as you guys remember, it was pulled for some modifications and then brought to us. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, so that really was just more internal discussion that we needed to make sure everybody was clear on all the points internally um, that were being proposed. Um, so it really was actually did not end up with any changes to the agreement. Um, but really more internal discussion and, and clarification points. Okay, thank you. And um, so we were curious about the timeline um, and and normally these permits are these uh, contracts are two years at a time, is that right? But we're hoping to extend it to like to make it the end of the calendar year, which lines up with the fiscal That's cycle, right? right? Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I do like to align this with the, with the budget year when I can. It really does contract management standpoint so that was kind of for me but um um you know uh really we just thought with the coming recommendations of the jctp as far out as we can really see and practically speaking as far as any changes that might happen in the future um two years is probably you know, the longest we want to go out you know um i i think there'll be some more recommendations and you know want to be able to make sure this contract is ready to to meet those recommendations. Um, kind of knowing what I do know about that project, um, we believe this sets us up well to do that without contract changes, but it is a bit of an unknown. So we also don't want the term to be too long. For the for the layman, can you tell us what JCTP is? That's the joint compatibility transportation project. Thank you. And um, okay. 
And one of the points that I really appreciated that, and I'm just, I hope it's okay that I just totally take the words out of your mouth, maybe Eric, but you're asking, why do we, <laughs> why are we providing a car to M Park and they are responsible for maintaining it? Which I thought was really wise. Can you explain that to us again? Um, so they are actually carrying the insurance on that vehicle. Um, and so they are taking the actions to maintain it as well. So that if there is any damage to it, um, it is in park and their insurance that will cover that damage first. Okay. And just so y'all know, that's pretty much 90% of my um, uh, finance, investment, and parking reports. So there we go. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. <laughs> Something that um, people in my district keep asking about is, can, can they call in park for boats, trailers, RVs, tabs that have been expired for over eight years, um, pallets of building material that have been there for over 10 years? Can, can, can in park be called for these things? So I would recommend that you share our Bremerton One app with, with those residents. Uh, in park is limited, we only can enforce against parking violations. So um, it, so it has to be a vehicle without a driver in it um, in order for them to enforce. Um, so pallets, no, but if you send it into Bremerton one, that pallets, does. Pallets, no. Uh, well, pallets, if they're just like sitting on the street. Not that's not a vehicle. Yeah. 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 But if Plus, you send that into, Bremerton one. yeah, Bremerton one, that would probably be a kind of Okay, thank you. Got it. And, and, and that is like still something that is technically against the law, right? I believe so. That's not really my area of expertise, but I will do it. So. Okay. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, that's really all the questions. So, uh, well done, you. Other questions, comments? Seeing there, I think I just had a couple myself. Um, I kind of want to highlight again on the, the delta between the existing contract and this contract. So if I remember last year on the committee, you gave a really nice overview of kind of where Impark was able to enforce in the city and how often. And if I remember one takeaway I had from that was if somebody's like right in the downtown core um, and they park there for eight hours on a given day, they're very likely to be caught because they'll come by twice in an eight hour period. If they're there for three hours um, and two hour parking, you know, the patrols aren't constant, so they may, may get away with it on a given day. Um, is this contract kind of changing the level of that enforcement, or what kind of looking for a yeah, like qualitative change? Sure. Um, yeah, I think it really does tighten up the expectation and the definition of enforcement in the downtown core. So that it, um, you know, in the past, we've had a certain number of enforcement actions, but enforcement is a very wide definition. So, you know, they can go through and say, oh, nobody's parked in any of the disabled. And they will have met their contract terms for that day. Um, and so this really, I think, meets the expectation of what we, you know, what we have heard. Um, this is what we really like. Um, and you know, we don't want to just stay enforcing action with no major health and safety concerns. Um, you know, it really meets that time enforcement on a daily basis. And so um, I added some of those definitions in, and um, those are things that, you know, I can run and definitely have gone, wait a second, why is this working this way? This is not what I expected. And so, you know, um, um, I, I will say that team is really experienced. They know our city well. They know, um, I would say, the, the public well. So they understand what is going on the street and why they're parking there. I ask him, like, like, what's going on here? You know, they they don't always know, but more than likely they, they've been around that area enough that they can see the activity and kind of understand what's going on. And um, because of that, you know, whenever there's a change, they always put out notices um, to people. That is a regular practice. Um, and um, they also kind of understand our downtown court business activity. Um, right now, our sign signage, and well, I should say, for a long time, our signage has been 4 a.m. to 7 p.m., mm -hmm. and that's kind of to address some of the shifts that we have at the shipyard and address some of the commuter parking overflow that we get. Um, we have a few 
Main Street, where it stops at 5 p.m. as also um, more on purpose because there are some folks that need to arrive in a little earlier. Because then we also have nighttime activities going on downtown Fort. We want to promote those. And, and um, so those are things that, that they know that we've taken into consideration in our current finance arrangement in the downtown court. Um, but there is the other side of that where, you know, we definitely have expectations that our signage is going to be enforced, you know, um, properly and all the time, you know, so, um, or at least on not on a basis that people aren't abusing it. You know? yeah. um, so this really, I think, tightens this up so that, you know, I, I will just say they have a lot of uh, demand on them. In fact, I was almost going to share <laughs> some of the, just the last two days of everywhere that only the LPR vehicle went. And so we're talking all of our annex areas in the last two days. You can see this map, our, our GPS on that vehicle. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And um, that's one vehicle. I saw them, you know, they have another vehicle, their own vehicle that they're driving. Um, I saw them out today in that. Um, they are out walking. Um, so the demand is just very huge. Um, it, you know, decreased a bit in during COVID in 2020, 2021. I saw it going back up. Uh, last year, definitely up. This year, contracts would be higher. Um, you know, it. They're busy folks, and they turn around a lot of citations. Still, it is not. You know, I still am like, why aren't we here? Well, you know, I wish they could be everywhere. They try to be everywhere, um, but. They really do. You know, I have some maps that show that. Um, but it just you know, the really good demand. I think Bremerton and some of these other port cities, or I should say shipyard cities, mm -hmm. are kind of a unique animal, are, are, are just really unique. Um, they have worked into part of it. Um, really only a few of them in the United States. So, if you're ever, ever interested. I mean, yeah. So, but. <laughs> no, 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 I, I was, I meant to prize when I was door knocking and running. Um, still, you know, I expected to hear maybe complaints about, I got a parking ticket, but instead I heard pretty loudly, like, I want people to get more parking tickets because I'm, you know, um, mm -hmm. people calling for more enforcement, just the limited parking we have. So um, there's a few other questions here. So like full, like full disclosure with, under with my museum hat on, I filled out the parking <laughs> plate form a few times. Um, or uh, mainly there's a there's a 15 minute loading zone right in front. Yeah. And we've had some events where I know people are going to come on load, and there's someone parked there for literally you know right. volunteer three four hours. Um, so yeah, full disclosure, I've done that with my museum head on. Um, but uh, kind of on that note, for I know they're mainly, mainly patrolling weekdays, but for weekends and for people who have an issue, um, and if a, a, like let's say that situation or some of the car is parked blocking someone's driveway or anything like that, is there? Are they reachable on the weekends, et cetera? Um, so they are enforcing on the weekends. Okay. This project does cover um, weekend time. They can report. And I would recommend uh, during the weekend time that you use the parking complaint line or just a phone number. Um, and I will say they don't really have an emergency response. Um, that is just something they really do. Um, so if you do have your... Um, you know, if something is locked and it is really an emergent total safety issue, then um, I do recommend reaching out to and one And you know, kind of everyone has to kind of engage. It's really a, you know, awesome safety issue. Or can I go knock on this person's door? Or what can I do? Um, you know, sometimes if the vehicle is parked on private property, you have some more options. Yeah. But okay. Good now. The last question I had was um, I think I heard too from business owners was looking at the possibility of we have the residential parking permit program and is there a way to extend that to business owners and possibly even their employees and another trade-off there is um if you do that and then all the business owners and employees are parking on the street then there's not customer parking for people wanting to visit our downtown it's a, it's a i don't know where i fall on it um conceptually but um for this contract will leave the wiggle room to, to like look at that and implement it if we if we wanted to um this doesn't really address that issue. I would say that we have already addressed it um, primarily in that we offer downtown employee parking at a discounted rate in the Washington Brush. Okay. And that is open. Um, there are, you, know, you kind of let market forces be market forces. So, um, and, you know, business planning be business planning. That's kind of the approach we have right now. And this contract just isn't really addressing that at this time. 
that may change, but I would think it would probably be a little bit outside of, of that there. You know, they basically just do whatever we ask them to do in that regards. So if we ask them to issue those, then I'm sure they would. Okay. Like yeah. That built it into the existing residential permit program, which allows them to contract or possibly. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So that's the question I had. Uh, sorry, double dip here. A couple things. Let me see if I can knock out five more percent of my final re report. But um, <laughs> one thing that I did learn is that you uh, get copied on all of the Bremerton one parking complaints. So if you do send that, so she's getting your emails, Jeff. She's probably even replying to them. Oh yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Very, very um, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Um, and so one of the things that was asked was who are the competitors. Um, if there was an option for a competitor, the other one would be Diamond, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to know if you want to speak a little bit more about if there are other competitors, if you've done pricing and yeah, so there all that. Are other competitors. Um, we, we uh, the main competitor that I can really compare to at this time um, in terms of is Diamond. Um, I'd say we are in a very competitive pricing structure. Let me say that. Um, it's, not exactly apples or oranges, <laughs> in the apples, the apples there, but uh, um, sure. it really is, you know, I'd say very competitive. There are, of course, other providers across the United States. Um, sometimes that means bringing somebody in to our state where we have you know, different laws and, um, you know, that is its own challenge. Right. Um, it would take some time to do that if we wanted to do something like that, um, you know, at least two years. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> they picked that up. These are very sensitive microphones. Um, and so I don't know that I see this is probably in here and I apologize, but it's uh, from what I have in my notes from um, from finances meeting is uh, it was four hundred twenty five thousand um, dollar contract projected enforcement. But what is that? What is that from four hundred twenty five thousand projected enforcement only? Yeah, so that's, that's, what we, that's what we funded at. Mm -hmm. um, the contract total is, is a little bit less than that. So it is actually less than that. But okay. that's where we budget. Um, we do have some other additional expenses that will fall into that same under enforcement and line under that line item. So the contract total itself is about 85000 and And we are replacing two vehicles, one soon, which is going to be that, that electric like golf cart. So, um, Roadworthy, uh, low speed vehicle, getting right. Yeah. Okay, and then, it, but soon we're going to have to replace the other vehicle that they use where they can go on other roads. You know, the right above thirty five miles an hour. Okay, but not this year. But it's coming up. Just something to be aware of since we're buying the vehicles and they're maintaining them. Um, and then this contract is still revenue generating. Okay, how much was that again? I did not write that number down, and I should have. Um, so our, our revenue projection this year is 425000 actually. Um, okay. The last two years, we really have been in the break-even point, um, but I do see, uh, but last year, we were much okay. higher than I expected, actually. Um, so we did actually, I would say, fairly break-even, but for the last two years, things have been a little bit different. Yeah. Um, in 2020, uh, we broke even in 2020. We actually are exceeded. I was for sure, like, oh boy, it's going to be a year, but it, it really wasn't. Actually, you know, things were just very different. Um, and 2021 kind of continued along that trend. Uh, sorry, kind of coming out of that, we're just kind of continuing to come out of that. Um, so that's why I wrote 425,000 for enforcement only because that's the projected revenue. But the contract itself, and is it in our packet? How much it costs? Um, I don't know that I see it on the bill agenda. Let me take a look. Oh gosh, there's. <laughs> I want to know what Anna's doing to get her little table on the side there. I'll show you. Thank you. So I don't think that I see the cost listed on the bill agenda itself. But um, anyway, um, so but, but it is revenue generating, so it's under four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Thank you. One quick call popped in my head, um, just to say it out loud, but I see it's in here under section B. So when there's special events from the city, um, it looks like they can be on call to do extra parking enforcement if needed. Okay. Fantastic. So, for example, if we have bridge blast and people are parking literally in the park on the sprinklers, they yeah. could be called upon to enforce. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> I've had questions there. Perfect. Um, 
No other questions, comments. I I feel bad to call you back for general business, but I'm kind of thinking, I feel like I one of the biggest things I heard from people like door knocking was parking and the questions on when do they come out, like what, who do I call, et cetera. Um, it's the kind of, yeah, so I don't, I don't know how, I just want to see how the council feels like it's an opportunity to kind of give an old broader overview of this is how, where they patrol and how to get a hold of them. Um, but no, we've got a lot coming up too. Trail. So I have good that neighbor guy. Yeah. Well, we didn't, didn't rate it there. high enough in our, in our <laughs> session, in our retreat, man. It was on there, right, Eric? Just put a quarter in me. Couldn't we just simply make an announcement that this information, you know, if you want to know like where they patrol and when they patrol and how you get a hold of them, it's in the packet. Yeah, I can make that. Basically saying, well, let's have a Q and A session for parking. It doesn't exactly fit. Q and A, but yeah. Well, I understand. Don't find that. Mm -hmm. And Dave Cooper, right? The Cooper Auto Fuel guy, he learned about the Bremerton one app and he told everybody in public comment last week. You remember that? Pat and Cooper, Fuel and Auto? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll let him be our spokesperson. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm hearing a desire for consent, so I'll we'll about that. Um, this will go on consent for next week. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Monroe. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Monroe. We won't park this item. Mm. Uh -huh. Oh, no. Oh, feel like you could be doing better, but it's a long day. I'll work on it. All right. We got two items left here. Next up, item B, I'm like losing count, B6. We have proposed ordinance to place a property tax levy increase for additional public safety services on the August 1st, 2023 primary ballot. And we have Fire Chief Pat McGannion, Police Chief Humble here to present. Thank you, Chiefs, for coming back. I think it's our fourth, third iteration on this one, or third meeting on it. Evening. Well, you, you read our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so before you is the um, proposed ordinance for the property tax increase, and the ballot language is also attached, um, asking for a 40 cents per thousand to the general property tax of the city for 17 new public safety FTEs. And this additional tax will bring in about $2.3 million. And I believe we're ready for questions. Sounds good. Let's make our, our orders for now to see if we have any uh, questions, comments on any issues with the ballot language. Um, and basically, another chance to give input. All right. All right. I know it would take up more ink, but I would just say full-time employees because a lot of people don't know what an FTE is. Okay. That's pretty minor. Consent? <laughs> 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 it took me a second to realize that you'd actually said that. <laughs> 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 <Right here>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just for clarity is that um in the, in, the in the actual ballot language, where yeah. is that under, I'm looking, staring it's at it. Under summary. Is the summary not, not the ballot, ballot language? That's in the explanatory. Okay. No, well, that's, yeah. that's just the agenda bill. Yeah. All right. Well, then I've been yeah. oh. wrong. <laughs> Happens to us all once in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, this would be nice. Perfect. That's right. So we have the summary bill, and then, yeah, below that is the uh, the actual prop one, public safety, let me. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just want to comment for apparently we're, uh, we're live and people are watching at home. Uh, we're kind of doing this nonchalant because we had an expensive discussion of this issue at a previous study session. Thank you. Ironed all this out. Just want people that are watching now to realize we really vetted this quite a bit and questioned the two chiefs. <laughs> so now it's like, okay, now let's look at the language. Are you okay with the language before, and then we vote on whether we want to allow the, the public to make the decisions. That's what we're no, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, we had the uh, 
uh, the, the retreat, another meeting after, another Public meeting safety. before, Public Safety Committee, okay. yeah, full PowerPoint walkthrough. Uh, so no, thank you. So I'll just jump in and say, um, one suggestion, see what people think, but as far as it says uh, under the actual proposition, concerning a proposition to provide for continual public safety, police fire, I, I, I've been kind of using the term public safety and support uh, recently, just say you know it's you know especially what y'all do is also helping folks in need um i'll throw that out there for consideration but it's the only only thing i thought of when staring at this language that uh, i wanted to throw out what are you saying you wanted to read um public safety levy Bremerton city council adopted the ordinance blank concerning a proposition to provide for continuous public safety and i would insert the words and support yeah. Comma, police fire. Uh, What's the end support for the understanding? Related costs and services? It says public safety services. Yeah, that would be other good. Animals. I mean, but that's what public safety services. Like, like you are hiring a secretary. I guess that is support. It already, it already says that. Hmm. Oh, good point. Um, <laughs> okay. Because Kylie Finnell is, you know, meticulous. I guess I'd like to reiterate that. I think that the more the voters can see, like, this is for 17 full-time employees, that's, that's a, a concept that anybody can grasp. Which, whereas, like, public safety services is kind of amorphous. So I'm just suggesting it. Would that be in, the, in that same, um, the actual levy uh, language added in there? Yeah, I, I'm simply suggesting it. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. die on this hill. <clears throat> My only concern on that is it would, would lock us in. So if the city had different needs in the future, because <clears throat> this levy is gonna go on, it would almost, you know, uh, I think it's, a, it's the, the levies to support that and then our immediate plan is to do that, but um, I don't. I, it was more of a almost a legal question to kind of lock us in. Like if we if we announce that Bob Smith is a new public safety employee, mm -hmm. and then we lay off Bob Smith because of situation changes, and they'll be like, "Wait a minute, I voted on Bob Smith," you know. So I think that to, sure. to keep it public safety to the general money, the, the general fund for public safety. And then the administration and the departments. Even if we say for 17, as we expect now, but if yeah. labor rates go up, only able to hire 16, no one's saying, well, wait a minute, where's That's the 17? Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Eric? So help me out, Chiefs, um, especially Chief McGanny. So the EMS levy, that comes up every once in a while, whatever it is, five years or 10 years or whatever. We want to vote for a 50 cent increase or whatever. <laughs> This one doesn't seem to have a sunset clause on, so this is perpetuity. Correct. Mm -hmm. And was there an option? I, I know the city of Bremerton is not the only one considering the city of university place has one on the calendar. I suspect there's many municipalities that are trying this this year. Um, first of all, why, why are they all trying it this year? Well, it's not just this year. Um, some of this language came from Cheney. Um, they ran one in 2016. Just trying to get funding because, as you know, the one percent yeah. is hurting all the services. Um, so not being able to bring it above one percent, everybody else is sure. feeling feeling the pain. Um, and so the cities are are trying this now. This, I mean, this is unusual. This is the first time we've ever done it sure. as a city, but um, and keeping it at this rate, so our total tax rate would be a dollar ninety per thousand. Mm -hmm. Keeps us well below our max of three dollars and thirty-seven point five cents. Um, yeah. So it gives the season grow. I mean, there's been times that our levy rate's been over two dollars and forty cents per thousand, just depending on a sub valuation. So this gives us that flexibility. Okay. So why why is the EMS levy have a sunset on it? Is that by code? By state, state law. law. State law. Okay. Now, now they did change state law. That you can run a permanent EMS levy. Okay. 
but we still have the same problem. You run into compression with it to where you have to do a wood lift. Uh, Bainbridge Island, they ran, the last time they ran their EMS levy was a permanent levy. Right. And do you know of the other cities that have done this, this 2016, January, et cetera, are they all in perpetuity or did any of them put a, a sunset clause? I did not find any sunset clause. I just want to revisit your suggestion on uh, um, to go have a right then show my screen here um, where it has effect of the measure if effect of the proposed measure if it becomes law this is what would appear in the voters guide uh, voters voters guide is on the second page it says proposition one um, public safety perfect yes the uh, yeah, second, yeah. Power growth second paragraph, the effect of the proposed measure comes law. Um, I started at that one and wondering if it would be good to say FDEs, because right now it just says City of Bremerton adopted ordinance number blank, contains proposal to be submitted, blah, blah. If approved, the Bremerton would levy additional regular property taxes, blah, blah. Revenue collected by this levy may only be used for public safety services and related costs. And I'm wondering if it's worth in there putting specifically that this is that this is for full-time employees, something about addressing shortage, just kind of when someone looks at that ballot measure, they know, oh, this isn't for equipment, this isn't for X, Y, and Z, this is actually gets kind of boots on the ground. Yeah, so it would be for 17 FTEs and the support that goes along with that, the vehicles or training. And yeah, that's what, I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, we can leave out that specific number so we're not tied in, but. Think about it. Okay. And I don't know what, what the, you know, what we're allowed to, what's allowed to be submitted to the voters' guide or whatnot, but there's some problem. I'm just making the suggestion. Oh. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking the same. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like there's a way to do it where you could say that the, the immediate plan is to bring on, you know, but not, not tie the actual the ballot. Mm -hmm. it, so. Yeah. Fill yes. the gap yeah. currently yeah. at. Well, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But some way in a sense. We wanted to. Oh, sorry. Be transparent. Well, there's a wordsmith in here you can do. So you're looking at this is the actual ballot measure. That's the actual measure. Okay. And then the next page is, is I got to write what would go on the voters. voters ballot. Ballot. Fine, but yeah. so the one where they're going to say yes or no on their actual ballot is this one. Or obviously, where it says yes or no. That's mm -hmm. what they're going to look at the ballot. Right. So this one. I, I agree. It's a little obtuse as to what they're asking for. So if I'm not looking at the voters pamphlet, not everybody does. They get the ballot and say, oh, okay, let me read this. Proposition to provide for continually public safety. What? I'm a taxpayer. I already paid for that. What the hell? Uh, other government services of the city. This proposition will increase. So I would say don't put the 17 FTE. Concerning a proposition to provide for increased public safety. Mm -hmm. Not continual. Mm -hmm. For increased mm -hmm. public yeah. safety. Yeah. Police fire other government services in the city. And that doesn't hamstring you into 17, but for uh, increased public safety. I like that. Yeah. I'm much more comfortable with that than yeah. as a number. Yeah. No. But in the end, it's what you guys are comfortable with. I mean, we're approving it, but we're just, you know, we're no, also I, voters. I, I, we also want to that, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah. So. He's a team. All right. Yeah. Or it sounds like we got um, majority on, on recommending that change. So, yeah. so next, when we vote on this, we're voting on the language that you're going to come in. Mm -hmm. Make a change to it after that, or would that have a couple of that? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. That's, that's a lot of words to yeah. now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. This is definitely, definitely the time. That'll of the be in our packet. The revised language will be in our packet this coming Friday. Mm -hmm. I would. Or, or Monday, 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 Monday or, Monday. or Tuesday. Before the meeting. <laughs> before the meeting. Yeah. I, I make the change tomorrow. Wednesday mm -hmm. before noon. <laughs> Afternoon. Good to you. <laughs> I'm perfect. I like that one. I mean, be, that, okay, that, my, my advance of change is something that we're going to explain it all. Yeah, that's a, a word of two. But on the, I still want to go back on the, well, what does go in the voters' guide for those to look at? I think there is a nice opportunity here to sum up all the hard work. Y'all done with the, with the PowerPoint you showed us last time we met um, on the need, on why there's such a need for more FTEs. 
Um, I know it's hard to sum all that up in a sentence or two, but um, for someone who got, at least when I always voted in the past, I always go to the voter's guide. And I, I like, I like appreciate Washington State because it makes it really easy. You say, here's the four, the people who submitted it, here's the four. And then there's usually a group who submits the against and they each get the rebuttal. And so it's really nice when the four statement is like, oh, that makes sense. Like I get why I'm, what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, there is there is really now that I read the, the uh, statement, there really isn't anything talking about the need. It's talking about the increase to the budget or in the tax, but it's not really talking about to fill a need or unmet needs or anything like that. So I can see why I can definitely yeah, see yeah. the point. In the voters pamphlet, so you have to have a committee for and a committee against that's where we will okay. attack okay the need you it's know the statement the, the statement harrison for, moving to silverdale and, and yeah we can, in, uh, we can in, put inside i see so maybe a mistake so this is this is not what's gonna there's time to work on this so really the, the, the voters will see is the Composition, right? Yeah. 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 Right. But the broken, I'm excited. Yeah. That. yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. So we'll we'll get together a committee for, and then they'll write a, uh, a statement for the. Thank. You. Okay. This explanatory statement is just being tacked on. Okay. I'm looking at an old voters' guide. All right. That makes more sense than I would draw my suggestion there. But yeah, for down the road, for whoever is in charge of that committee, um, there's opportunity. Okay. Sorry, Jennifer. What do you want? Was it just that part? I was just going to there? say we can't be that committee because right. we are right. the city. Right. <laughs> right. And I made a little rhyme, and that's yeah. all I'm going to say. <laughs> Y'all are good at word stuff, so I'm going to mm -hmm. let you do your thing. Okay, appreciate the clarification. All right, so any other suggestion, board Smiths, to the, I guess, just the proposition statement? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <clears throat> You're laughing at me. No, I just had no. something in my throat. Okay. Okay, so nothing there. All right. So then I assume general business is appropriate for something so public. <laughs> All right. Do we no vacations plan? Okay. Do we need this on general business? Is that the general feeling here? Oh yeah. I, I think okay. it, yeah. Hold on. Okay. I just they presented so many times. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. This is gonna make up. I don't think it's I don't like it's legally meetings. required, but I think it's a smart thing to, to make it transparent. Yeah. It'll be like mm -hmm. Romeo and Juliet. They present, oh, present again, sweet angel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the guys oh. are right. Right. Yeah. So I, I guess my, voice, my sure. question is, if you want us to do the PowerPoint presentation that we've already done along with that, or just to present the ordinance? I, personally speaking, I thought it was a really nice PowerPoint. Um, so last time that I was presented at uh, council at a study session before, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a nice chance to put in front of people why this is going forward. Um, I just wanted to I'll, be clear. I'll leave it, yeah. leave it up to you too, but I, yeah, I, I would support it. Okay. Seeing head nods. So, okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll just the one word change, uh, what we settled on for the proposition statement, and this will go on general business. All right. Thank you. Thank you for all the hard work. Go forward and prosper. All right. Our last last three things since we already did seven since we did B seven we just have B eight proposed ordinance to add BMC chapter two point three four and to create a permanent race equity um, commission. And why is Clint not here today? We have attorney. Okay. Good. Back, okay. Right. And um, I think as a recap for anyone listening, we had uh, a retreat on this. We had study session. We got some main questions to answer. Um, attorney went and wrote a full ordinance, which is in the packet. And now we're here to look at this ordinance and um, see if we're good to move it forward to business. Sure. 
Sure. So the things that um, I kind of went over at the last study session were to get direction from council on where you wanted me to go with drafting. For example, the last um, study session we talked about whether it was going to be a race equity advisory commission or a diversity equity and inclusion advisory commission or something other than um, limited to race. The majority of the council at that time said um, that they should be race focused, so that's what I drafted. Um, we talked about compensation. I think at this point, the majority of the council decided no compensation at this point. We talked about um, residency requirements. We talked about um, whether uh, the duties would be um, outlined specifically or generally. And then we also had a discussion about whether the committee would accept public comment or not. And that was one of the kind of assignments that I had to research. Um, and I, I did my own research and then I actually asked the RSC for opinion as well. Um, and it is that if public comment is accepted either in written or in oral form, by an advisory committee, it does then bring it under the committee. And so I think Quinn had spoken to, um, you know, there's the, the, the risk analysis for being subject to the OPMA um, for the committee members, but there was also some functional, like the committee itself had, um, when it was the council committee, talked about feeling constrained by that. Um, so if the council does not want the committee to be subject to the OPMA, it's best that it just stay an advisory committee only, that it not accept public comment, and that um, if citizen community members want to make comments related to the activities of the committee, certainly they can be directed to make those to the administration of the council emails that people are already open them to. Um, and so it's still, you know, public input, but that, that's where that is on that. And, but it, I think, I know that right now we're not addressing that with other committees. This is the first committee I'm creating or being a part of. Commission. 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 Right. Yeah. Right. That's okay. They're, they're really similar um, under our code. They're big, 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 but important difference. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, as we, I mean, you know, if we go back and revise those, we'll probably be addressing these issues specifically. Um, so I think it's important. But so this is what we have now. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. I feel like I've talked about this one quite a bit. So I don't know how you go over everything again. Eric, you have <laughs> Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, I already kicked us off. Okay, so given that, and remember what Quinn was saying about how important it is for the public to be able to. to to ask questions and we're kind of settling on, well, they could put it in writing, but kind of nix that. I say, let them be subject to OPMA and get comments. So maybe keep it as as writing comments um, or maybe leave it up to the committee, but they have to understand then you violate OPMA, it comes out of your pocket. It does. Okay, and so then there needs to be training. training. But, I'm sorry. <laughs> No, 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 no. I want them to be able to have the, I mean, this isn't a threat. This is like, I want to give you the, because this committee needs to have public, right? I, I believe it does. I, I believe it does. And so, so then if you want to, if you want public uh, comment, and then actually when this committee meets, they can decide if they want to have public comment or not. Can you word it that way? So put it in there. If the committee decides they want to accept uh, public comment, I assume they will. Just be advised that uh, whatever they're subject to OPMA, just put it in the language. The I, I can't can write decide. it that way. I didn't want to write it that way. <laughs> I know, but, <laughs> I think, but, but I mean, okay, sure. Just that, um, I, I wanted the council to make that decision about whether they wanted, um, you know, we. Absolutely, it is on that individual person. But as far as the penalty, the attorney fee for the provision, with, assuming that the people were acting in the course or, or in good faith, um, would most likely 
be for by the city. Um, and so the, the okay. $500 penalties are, you know, yeah, it's a, and it's nothing. And of course, it's a violation. I think someone recently got hit with like $5,000. With um, me? No, 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 not here. <laughs> 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 the attorney's fees, their actual. Okay. So I do see your point because then it'd be like, uh, we're not giving them city emails. Uh, anything that was sent to them becomes a public record. And if they can't produce it, that could be an issue. And the city would be culpable for that. Right. And that those are not things that are covered under our insurance either. And so yeah. as the... I retract that then, but that, that really, I'm not sure this this thing is going to serve a useful purpose. I'm sorry. But maybe it will. And then the, the other thing is just... Um, I had asked the question about why are we allowing non-residents of Bremerton on the committee? And if I recall correctly, it was explained, well, there's one person on the committee that lives right across the street. I'm sorry, but this is not about one person. This is setting up a commission for arguably in perpetuity. And it, you don't do that. So remember, I'm being districted out I didn't petition the council to say, hey, look, I'm on the council. Let's just move the street over. I accept it happened. It is what it is. You cannot consider the individual. That needs to be stricken. I don't even know who it is. It's not a personal vendetta. It is. This is what it should be. It should be a resident of the city of Bremerton, like all our other committees. And that's the way it should be. So that one, and then uh, I guess go with your suggestions and no public comment, which is tough. Right. Well, and I guess I want to say that like, it's, it's not so much that if, if we do public comment, and I just want everyone to know what the ramifications are, and that I think for the people who were on the committee last year, there was a lot of um, desire on the part of the people who were on the committee for it not to be subject to LPMA. So I'm not it's not just the liability, they actually did not want it to be subject to, and that was a very persistent. And, and, uh, uh, okay, so I think that topic was confusing to the to the group to understand. And and, there, and I apologize for burning when you talked, you know what I was actually thinking about, and Director Elevato knows, because when I was on the Arts Commission, none of us were like, we did not understand OPMA. So yeah. to wrangle us, to get us to under to understand it, right? Like that's what I was actually groaning about. And that's why I apologize for that during your comment. The desire was to have people be able to be to give their feedback on an issue. But what they also wanted to do, which it, it, here's the problem, you can't do that. Um, you can't have public comment and work. What they really wanted to do is have smaller working groups so that um if they like they were concerned about breaking quorum in small working groups, right? So um, that was the issue with OPMA. They they did like the public comment, even the really crappy people that would show up and say negative stuff, like whatever. But there was a lot of people. <laughs> well, I would say. So let's, uh, let's retract maybe crappy. Yeah. Just like people with differing opinions. Strong different Sometimes people come to com public comment and they say inappropriate things, y'all. Okay. I'm going to say then they use potty mouth language, and which is kind of crappy. Um, <laughs> we're at the end of our day. So I just wanted to clarify that point for you, which was they like the public comment, but they also wanted to be able to have working groups. Now, this is not necessarily what a commission is going to be. I definitely agree at this point in time that to wrangle new people that it would be difficult to train them on OPMA as, you know, like new commissioners or new commission. So I'm going to suggest this has a lot of moving pieces to it. Um, let's do a round. So Eric, you touched on the public comment side, but there's these other specifically on the public comments and OPMA and then um, go to the other moving parts. Um, rehash. So, and then I'm going to, uh, I'm sorry, I had her hand up way back when, but then I'll, I'll go on to the Michael. Yeah. A, it's from OPMA. B, I agree with Eric, since there's nothing we can do about unincorporated Kitsap County. Um, I, I agree that that, for now. We'll yeah, that, that, that should be struck. See, I got them both out. <laughs> Snuck it in. All right. I'm sorry. Michael. So, yeah, I was on uh, thinking no public comment, but 
if somebody has a comment for the city about race equity, they can address it to the mayor. They can address it to a new diversity, equity, inclusion manager. And then the, and they can sit, then turn to the commission and say, hey, we have something brewing. There's some concern. And right, there's nothing that would stop that. So, right. Yeah. The, again, like it says, it's the, it's to serve it's to serve us. Um, to, to, kind of like we ask the audit community to audit something, well, we can ask this commission to look for the things and we'll be hearing that from the general public. Sure. So, like, I think it's an example. Um, the council has received um, feedback in the past about the recruitment process for vacancy, correct? And that it was not, that recruitment was done in a way that wasn't inclusive and that might have um, limited the number of applicants and people who were kind of connected, right? And that, um, so let's say the council gets those comments, right? Um, and, you know, you, you can certainly talk about it amongst yourselves and do a study session and all that kind of stuff. We have this commission, you could also say, hey, we would like some advice on this. You know, so if there's someone from the council, you know, the council president contacted the chair and say, hey, we've got these comments, council, you know, you would talk about it first as a group that you wanted the commission to do it, and then you would submit it and you get to know how the audit committee So that's how I see that working. Is that similar to how you guys see it working? I'll jump in and say, and I'll see you sharing that. Yeah, I, I so if we just want to clarify, if, if they are subject to public comment and OPMA, then they really can't meet as a, as a whole group. They can't go to Starbucks and have five people around the table and, and chat. Is that right? So, or without notice? Yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I got it right. There's a couple of things. Okay. You know, our charter has the requirement that all meetings be open to the public. Okay. so. I, if, if they asked me if they could do that, then I would say no. Okay. It's that if they do that and then it doesn't, if, you, if you're not subject to OPMA and you're just subject to the charter, our charter doesn't have a $500 per occurrence penalty provision as well as the, the what acts as incentive for people to bring lawsuits is the attorney fee provision and that you can bring them without having a you know, pay that from cost, and some lawyers will take those, you know, when they see one that's easy because they know they're going to get their fees. And, and so hmm. it's, it doesn't mean that they're going to be able to meet outside of um, a public setting. I mean, the work of the committee is going to be done in the, in the public. Okay. It just means that there's not going to be a, the same type of monetary consequences. Or for not doing so, then if there was subject to opening. So if that changes the, the analysis, I'll just say I personally feel um, comfortable not allowing public comment, knowing kind of two things. One, that I would expect the people um, appointed to the commission to be folks that are connected in the community, um, that are, you know, have, have roots and know people and can go out and get input. Um, you know, Absolutely. if stuff comes up, that's kind of one. And two, um, I think to Michael's point that uh, folks can always submit public comment to to us, to the mayor, um, on any any item. This, the, anything they're discussing, anything public works committee discussing, anything the planning commission discussing, um, it can come, you know, to us. So I, I feel like there is still an avenue for folks to give input. Sure. The, the, I mean, I, I suspect that part of the reason that people will be selected to be on the committee is that. They, they have the connections with the you know community to share and things like that. We're certainly not going to ask that they be taken back or something and not talk to people. It's just going to be whether a part of their meeting is going to be opening up the floor to have the public speak and have that moderated by a chair mm -hmm. and um, you know whether there ends up being back and forth discourse and then if you did it by Bringing comments, you know, kind of the, 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 my opinion and MRC's opinion was the same. It, it, written comments lessen your First Amendment issues because um, you don't have, I mean, it, it's just a little bit more control, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, you, you'd still be subject to open. Okay. Um, I just want to say, look, two, we can 
this can always be amended down the road based on right it's an ordinance so just yeah um okay so any other comments questions specifically on opma and public comment or do we have mostly a consensus to stick with no public comment for now in this ordinance yes another i'm just gonna say another idea would be if the committee wanted to have um i guess like just to let the public comment on something but you know through this couldn't do this for themselves a, a, a thing that can be recommended would be that there, whatever that item is be put on a study session and then the council kind of host they um as an agenda item and then does the public comment um basically like bringing it up a level and say instead of them getting public comment frankly to say that you know we can't do this but we're, we're recommending that the council take this issue up mm -hmm. and put it on a study session whatever it may be I would just like to say thank you for getting us the third base here with this. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're almost there and all we got, I feel very, I feel pretty comfortable with how you set it up because I know that you're conscientious about taking our uh, feedback and I'm ready to, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I think it, I think you know how to protect the city's interests and also take people's comments into perspective. So thank you for that. So then as, as written right now, um, Oh, sorry, should I should just double check on, okay, so we're okay with as it's written, or no, not okay, sorry, but as, as OPNA uh, goes. It's the 24.020, um, that's, that's the one where it, it opens it up to unincorporated Kitsap County. That was the next I was gonna get to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so on, so on that one, yeah, so as it's written right now, as we said, Bremerton address are unincorporated, um, so we're hearing some, and so any other comments on, Resident of the city of so, Bremerton. Okay, just we have like an proposal to change it just yeah. to Bremerton. So, folks want to respond to that. The perspective on that is it's under um, section 32 of the of our charter. It's that uh, being a resident is a requirement unless the ordinance states otherwise. So, for example, last year we amended our audit committee ordinance to clarify that the city auditor could be outside of the um, city limits, could reside outside of the city limits. Which I believe had been a practice, but it, it was a little unclear, so we made it um, more clear that it was okay. Um, so the charter allows you to have the ordinance um, different than that, but the default and what is the, I, I, I'm not aware of any other committees that um, deviate from the normal. Can I commission? Well, let's see. Can um, no. Okay, so you're saying that, yeah, so let's go on. And, and I, just want to bring some, I just want to bring some more clarity about other reasons why opening it up in this way would be a benefit to this commission, okay? Um, it has to do with sheer numbers uh, of availability of people. Now, people who live across the street or two blocks down or one mile away, we're still under some of the same interlocal agreements for, for public safety, for instance. So they might be interacting, not necessarily with Kitsap, you know, with uh, Kitsap Sheriff, but maybe with Bremerton, uh, a lot of folks with that address are probably going to be interacting in the city of Bremerton for work, for leisure, for uh, church, things like that. And uh, the, it opens up a population of folks that can serve on this commission that aren't necessarily like when you start to think about the hours that our committee meetings meet, and this is going to be in an e probably an evening time. Folks work different hours, okay? And so when you think about underrepresented populations, there are folks who have different types of work hours. And so it opens up the pool to people that are directly, you know, in Bremerton and not necessarily in the city of Bremerton, but I mean, you think about the number, I don't even know what our population is right now. It's the end of a long night, but we have a small population in some categories of diversity. So I just wanted to throw that information out there and let y'all do what you want. Michael or on this one, I'm, I'm waiting. I, I, I don't feel I don't feel I've heard a compelling enough reason that we should open it up. Um, if 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 we if we run into this problem, we can make we can make that exception. I, I don't know. I, I don't feel strong enough, here, you know, to go too hard for it. But it just seems like it makes sense to me. Uh, it should be Bremerton uh, County has a REAC, Bainbridge has a REAC, other cities are doing them. So, like, you know, it seems weird to 
have somebody uh, from, you know, but I, but I hear you and I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, maybe clearer than you actually said. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Like I said, y'all are much better at this word stuff. Did you say any comments on residency? No, not on residency. Okay. I'll say, like, I, I think I've changed my mind on this lately because originally, oh, oh. did you have something to jump in here with? Planning Commission allows it. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Another point of clarity. Well, this is, so, she said it way better yeah. than me. No, good. So, what I'm thinking about it, it it's um, like one, I appreciate, hey, the tax paying citizens are paying city taxes because they're actually in city limits, um, should be able to serve. But I'm actually going to say out loud, I kind of feel like almost all commissions, committees oh. should be open mm -hmm. wider because. Here's, here's my thinking. Um, if we open this up and, you know, the mayor appoints someone to a commissioner committee and says, oh, yeah, they're from Walla Walla, um, right? Or even like, oh, they, they live they live and work in Bainbridge, but they want to tell what Bremerton was to do, right? One, I don't think this mayor or any mayor would do that in the first place. And second, council would be able to say in confirmation and go, wait a minute, they live in Bainbridge, do they have any ties to Bremerton? No, then no, we're not going to confirm them. Um, so I feel like we could, by opening it up, to allow that case-by-case -case basis where you say this person's literally one, you know, across the street outside city limits, or this person is nearby, but they live and work in, you know, downtown all the time, and this could apply to almost any commission. So that's kind of where I'm at these days. I'd like I trust mayor and council enough to look at the person and know if they actually have ties to Bremerton or not. There's a little language that I overheard mm -hmm. from the planning commission has an exception mm -hmm. if a qualified applicant. That is a resident of the city can't be found. They can go out. Okay, so the think about that language. If yeah, if one, if one, oh, yeah, if a person's not available. Oh, that's fine. So I'm going to do a second second round on that. Just having our out there. I don't. Planning official. I've never had anyone that I've never had to do it. We've always had qualified applicants. Yeah. So I've always believed in. Uh, now I'm lost of words, but uh, compromise. So I'm okay with that language put in there. If the qualified candidate cannot be found, I don't know if you say qualified because, well, is there, there's not really technically a qualification to be on a planning commission. Usually it's somebody, well, no, that's, that's the, uh, the design. That's when you need to have an architect, someone with educational background. The planning commission is just an interest. Yeah. And so I don't, I'm a little confused. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, right. I think but, it means that no one's applying to be on this mission. Like, okay. As long as no it's not, you know, because right? that's kind of a, yeah. Well, it, as long as it's taken the right time. So there could be reasons that do want to recognize that. Yeah. Well, Basically, if you don't have the applicant, because there, anyone's qualified if you're over 18. Yeah. And a resident of Bremerton, we have to choose from that. But if we only have, if for whatever it says five to nine, and there's only four people that apply, and you did the public outreach, okay, fine, then you can go outside the city. That's, that would be the, the the condition that would work. That would be your qualify. I don't like that word, but I understand what you're saying. But that would be the situation. Let's let Anna jump in, and then I have a yeah a response on that one. Me? Yeah. Okay, good. So, again, I don't think it's because I pay taxes here by gum, and therefore only people like me who pay taxes can be on this commission. I think it's really specific that there is nothing we can do about unincorporated Kitsap County. We can do things about the city of Bremerton, but we can't do anything. We can't put sidewalks to connect school kids to crosswalks. If that land lies in Kitsap County, there is nothing we can do. So I think that that's why I, I'm suggesting this clause should be struck. Say so to that, somebody who lives just outside city limits and spends all their time, say downtown, may have comments specifically only about downtown, which we do have control over. Um, I don't well, know, those those comments yeah. are can be written to the to the committee. Fair enough. And then. Uh, I, I'm thinking, can I just follow up? Yeah, yeah, sure. 
So I'm thinking really about the one of the people who gave public comment last week, who said that um, he felt very connected to Bremerton, except he did not live here because the gangs had driven him out. Um, and I feel that just because someone feels that they have a connection to Bremerton, you know, it's like, are they living here? <laughs> That's it. I'm uh, think of their application they'd have. Yeah. And then quick other response to uh, before I forget it. Sorry. Um, what were we saying before the residency? Oh, the oh, qualified. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, the qualified part. I, I there is a concern there because I remember on audit committee there, there was one application and um, they lived in city limits. But I think when it said like you know why do you want to be on this committee? The answer was literally quote I'm very smart. That's it. <gasps> Said how long have you lived in Bremer? Because you know it was an application that was not, um, I'd call serious. So, oh. do you think we need to think about that in terms of? You know, that's what that's what I would call an unqualified application. But that language is, is good to nail down. Well, you know. yeah, I think that's part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we don't have like a job description for the here, but Okay, I think this one's going to be one that we're more likely to have people mm -hmm. want to be on. You're going to have all kinds of people that are going to want to be on it, so yeah. that's makes me nervous. I'm going all over the place, but I think I'm settling on let's strike the language, and if it becomes a problem with binding folks, then we will we can make that change. Look, like we did with all a problem. Okay. I mean, are we done? Can we put it on consent? Wait, no. Not <laughs> right. Right. I've been waiting. On the I'm top sorry. one. Yeah. There are other items. I'm sorry. Um, are we yeah, not done yet? No. All right. We're there. Uh, all right. Huh. So it sounds like we have, I guess, you know, that needs to fall in that same. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that, that covers go. all the concerns. Okay. I am dying on this hill right now. Just kidding. No, I mean, it is what it knows. It's fine. No, I said my piece. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, but, I'm just going to take out that parenthetical. Okay. So we'll take out the parenthetical okay. to go to. <sighs> and going to keep in mind, this will go to a general business. We'll talk about we'll talk about it in a bit, exactly the timeline, but um, it's a good public comment. We can always re rehash it. Okay. Any other comments on the ordinance as proposed? Topic, and then we'll move around about Denise. Um, it was a close vote, uh, four to three over the naming of it. And I've been thinking a lot about it this week. Um, uh, mainly uh, after last week's council meeting. Um, and I cannot be Denise Fry and not say something. Um, about history repeating itself over and over again with this kind of stuff. And that is, you all know that I worked for the YWCA for many years. What you might not know is the YWCA um, started working in racial justice before it started working in women's issues. And that many uh, suffragettes started out as abolitionists. And yet, when the 14th Amendment was being considered, it was decided to leave women behind. It was decided to leave women off of that because, and I'll quote, it was Frederick Douglass who said, uh, it's the Negro's hour. And so it took women many, 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 many more years uh, to gain the traction again, to bring that back. Um, do we still have it in Kitsap County? And I'm talking about sexism. Yes. I mean, I was just told a year ago that I was not going to get a promised raise because I had a wealthy boyfriend. I'm an executive. And I was told this in Kitsap County. If you asked women through the city, through the county, through whatever, we experience sexism every single day mm -hmm. and usually don't even notice it. I notice it. And I feel sad. 
Um, I want this commission to be successful. I really do. We can't afford it not to be successful with this. And it's a mayor's commission. The mayor's going to be working with this commission. And he's hiring a diversity, equity, and inclusion manager. And we're refusing to call this commission that. I think that's setting the stage for a lot of conflict. Um, between the council and the mayor, uh, this committee and the mayor, or potential conflict that I really would like to avoid. And some people may say, and I will, I, I'm not going to die on this sword. I'm not going to, I will go along with what the group decides. I really do, will. But I need to be your resident feminist here and tell you, we have work to do. We have work to do. And I felt it last week in, in council. And I'm just going to come out there and say it. It was a very uncomfortable meeting for me. And it was gender-based discomfort. Whether that was shared by anybody else, I don't know. But I've got to call it what it is and say, we can pretend we don't have a problem with sexism. I actually was told by a, another council member at last week's meeting leaned over and said, your predecessor is going to have words with you if you keep, you know, fighting this, this race, you know, equity. And I said, no, she won't, because she charged the city with sexism as well as racism. So how quickly we forget. I'm not saying that anybody means it. I'm saying that that's the way it happens. I'm just calling it if I see it because that's what I do. And I'll go along with whatever the council decides and be quite happy with it, actually. Before Eric, I did uh, uh, your specific proposal for the title or any amendment, you know, any. any I'd just or rather or it be whatever. I mean, we're calling it the diversity, yeah. equity, and inclusion uh, position. Um, I. That's not saying I don't think racism is but, but the title at the Diversity Equity and Inclusion Commission. Okay, I just want to see yeah. that. Yeah. Eric. Okay, so I think I was the deciding vote. Uh, or three or whatever for race equity. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't want to get into yesterday's. Yeah, let's keep it on the. On the, on the mm -hmm. Keep your, what your, your talking point you said tonight, next Wednesday. I think he'll win everyone over. He won me over. Firstly, I could an inclusion and change my mind. Okay. So that's what I would like. And if someone else is going to change their mind the other way, now we have the majority that wants the first thing. I'm going to speak all because this is, I kind of said last time, I was um, was on the fence and felt truly on the fence. And maybe it's worth going to public um, comment on. Um, because I appreciate everything you just said, and that was one of the reasons I, um, when I was on that fence, I said I'm going to go on this side of DEI. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm struggling here because I don't want to, I don't want this this title to be um, the thing that holds it up from from getting done. Um, and I just want to throw out a couple options we could discuss um, because I was leaving as is, going the full DEI doing something like Olympia with the Social Justice and Equity Committee title. Mm -hmm. um, I, had, I, had, I had mentioned that what they did was they did that title and then the description, they called out race as a prominent factor and then also mentioned gender and other other items. I say we could also go the other way, keep it titled Race Equity Advisory Commission and then call out in the description of the group um, that is not, although that is the principal component, it's not limited to it. I'm just going to throw some options out there. I know this, is a, this is definitely probably the toughest conversation and, and crap in this. And so. why do we schedule these for the end of the evening? Because it's me. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> seriously yeah. 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 Because I, I think we're up on the meeting items that I'm on are always last. Trying to get us down the staff. I'm all yeah. for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> I just wonder if, if this is a little putting the cart before the horse. Could this be held? for our DEI consultant in the program. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if we'd be sitting on it too long. I, I, I just, and, and I don't know. I, 
I, it's interesting. I, well, I don't feel super strongly one way or the other. So, you know, I, I, and I also feel I like to see the, you know, a good majority on something anyways. I hate to see those kind of split stuff. Mm -hmm. But I just, I, you know, it, it, yeah. I, I just, I didn't, when I advocated for the race equity title, it's because those are the folks who came to us and asked for that. And um, I just wanted to honor that original request. Um, and, and like I said, it is one of the hotter issues that we have to make some progress on. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, if we're not to steal your consultant, but if but if there's a like, you know, somebody coming to advise the city on what would be best way to do that, could they answer one question for us? You know. Anyways. And I worried that for me talking to folks that split, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, I don't mean to throw some in, but um, oh. as Eric kind of flipped, I kind of flipped actually more almost on keeping the race equity title. And I'll, I'll just say bluntly two reasons. One, um, you know, there's, there's been unfounded allegations that, you know, the city disbanded, you know, REAC, which, uh, you know, wasn't the case as we've discussed. It just didn't have the proper legal framework, which is what we're trying to create here. So in one sense, the continuity of keeping react react, I think is really strong and showing, no, he didn't just um, And the other, and so for that kind of reason of keeping it there, adding language that they're not constrained, to make it clear, they're not constrained only to talk about race issues, they can talk about other things and then let them work on the title. But yeah, I'd rather yeah. not be the case. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. That would be, I mean, that would be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can't tell them what they need to talk about. Right, there's, yeah. there's women, there's folks who, you know, you know. Everybody here is, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, everybody oh, here oh, is white. Everybody here is white. So you, like your version of diversity is watered down. So you cannot, in good conscience, not take public comment to make this decision. Okay. So uh, you know where I sit on it. And I just, I think that it's not fair that we just say feminism is one thing because, and I super appreciate everything you said, Denise, except the part where you said it's Negro's hour. You know what? A quote. The, yes, That's but a quote. hold on. Let me, let me just make my comment. Black women got left behind and black women and other women of color continue to suffer the effects way worse than we have, way worse than we did. We've had our own struggles. Okay, but you know, having worked worked at the YWCA, who were the people that come in that have struggled the most and faced the most uh, adversity, faced the most discrimination, faced the most? You know what I mean? Like it's it's about race. When we are able to analyze race, it takes like it takes care of everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm just. <laughs> Frustrated. I'm frustrated by this. I and think we do need professionals at the table. Um, I, I just, I have been a certified race relations trainer and coach. Granted, I'm white, but I've got more in common with with. I, I it, let's not even go there. I don't believe in the hierarchy of oppression, and I've said that before. I don't think you can say that one person has it worse. Than enough. I think we have to battle. I see everything's being connected. Everything's being connected, all the isms. And we have a horrible track record with race in this country, and we've got to do something about it. But I'm tired of being excluded. Go to Anna before that. So I just want to reiterate that you know, we will get public comment on this. We're just trying to see if we have consensus to put this agenda bill out there for public comment on a general study session, and we can talk about the option of doing a um, public feedback only at a general business meeting or whether to, you know, how to proceed forward. I'm also, I can also mm -hmm. make it blank if you want me to put that into the agenda. Mm -hmm. And then, you know what I'm saying? Like, and write mm -hmm. in the bill that right now, that, that there's not consensus feedback. right now. So the only public comment on this that I'm aware of is from a single individual who was a former member of the Race Equity Advisory Committee. This is the Race Equity Advisory Commission. I'm really 
I completely agree with you, Denise. Um, I feel that, although I, I got to say that from everything I know, race is the most bitter. It's just cloud the back of your throat with tears. It's just that bitter. Um, well, this, I, this, this I know about. Um, there's, there is inequity all over, and that's why I voted for the diversity, equity, and inclusion title, or social justice and equity. But we voted, and the majority of council wanted to call it the Race Equity Advisory Commission. Um, should we take this up in some other way? I am totally behind that. I think the majority voted for race equity. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah they did. It, wasn't like a real, we, yeah. it was four to three. Just, just vote. And, and also it was a straw, straw poll. poll. It was also not a vote. Because you don't it was a straw poll. poll. This was just direction for me to draft something. But the final decision being made after we have a chance for public comment in compliance. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Thank let's let you. it. Let's so. let the public <laughs> comment happen. That sounds good because often when we have, have that public comment, we like right. hear things that just make us go, oh my gosh. So, so. To, I guess we could have it on just for public comment next week and listen. We could have it. And then, I mean, there's, so that's like an awesome. Public hearing? Like, um, or just, just to accept no, public no comment. No action, yeah. 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 Without, without action anticipated and then come back for another study session to kind of discuss what we heard or you can do it however you guys want. I'm just throwing that option. If, if we say action is intended, to, real quick technical, can we then backpedal and go, actually, we, we're going to have to discuss this some more? Okay. And yeah, in, in any general item, we can, um, someone makes some, you know. Great. One. Hold on. Sorry. Nobody can make a motion, right? No, I think it's good to review this because, like, we take the public comment. No count, no more council may make a motion. I mean, that may happen, right? And go, okay, well, there's no motion. Next item. Um, or like the emotion or no second, or the emotion second, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. say I want to, I want to. Um, because like this right is right just for study but, session yeah. and drafting purposes. Mm -hmm. like the last study session we were going one way and now we're going a different way. Um, and and that's fine. And we, yeah. But we aren't making decisions until after we get public comment. Correct. So, um, great. I can. All I need to know about for next next week would be, do you want me to take um, can we take these out where it says a creation of a blank advisory commission uh, or do something, leave it how it is right now, how it went out in this packet? Just leave it. Leave it. Yeah. And then you guys we'll will talk about Okay. I'll, 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 I'm good with okay. that. The only thing I'll change then is the parenthetical on residency or do you yes. want to? Okay. Uh, Please change that. Yeah, I think we're there. Mike, put your hand up though. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. okay. Oh, how, um, how, uh, how does the, how is the public going to know that one of the things we're considering is just the, the, you know, nomenclature of this com commission. Um, they'll find out. <laughs> and not just that. It's not me. You people are watching right now. They they watch the recorded. They see the agenda. They watch the recorded. They take our clips. They put it on the social media sites. People show up and talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if there's some other way that you want to get out, no, I just want to make sure we have yeah. good good inputs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and thing, not just when Kylie presents it, she could. Well, and I could also in the agenda bill, I could write up that the council is considering. <laughs> The specific issue is this the only one now? Because I mean, we did have a couple, and now we're done. Yeah, I want to circle back to that. So the um, okay, I think we I think we had majority on the language for um, residents, except no, except for qualified language. Yeah, vote, but that doesn't matter. But so it it doesn't even. There's no voting. Yeah. This is a straw yeah. poll. Yeah. So I think. Yeah. May I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. Okay. So the one thing is there anything besides? And this is not. I'm sorry. I'm probably taking. Is there anything else besides the name of it that we are? That's in? where I'm getting to. Um, okay. Sorry. So one, one thing. Just want to clarify. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough. No. More than fast than done. Uh, okay. So I think we're good on that. The language on the qualified. Um, the one issue of if we get an application that, oh. you know, like the mayor's not 
I thought we were just going to yeah. yeah, I thought we were just going to leave it without uh, it. Okay. change it if we needed to, like we did an audit. Down the road. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So we're good there. Um, all right. So we got the title issue. Um, that's taken care of. I think we got public comment issue. And then there was one other that we talked about last. Powers week. and duties specific or general, and I think we went with. General. Oh, that's right. That was I think not controversial. Okay. So for next week, folks, good with. Uh, to leave the title. Oh, so you sorry, you recommend to leave the title as is, but yeah, first, I was, yeah. the only thing I was going to change after, uh, by, from what you're seeing right now is the parenthetical, and then I'm going to leave that. everything left, uh, and then I, I can put in the agenda bill something to the fact that the council is um, welcome to public comment. Yeah, public 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 comment on these issues or something. Like a public that. hearing only, okay, for a public comment only, no action. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> And that is, <laughs> I don't want to give you this question now, so you don't, you don't have to answer to this now, but maybe for next Wednesday, so I'm not blindsiding you with this. If you have a race equity commission and they meet and they bring up other issues such as sexual orientation, social economic status, gender identity, religion, language, age, Marital status, veteran status, mental abilities, and disabilities, which all fall under common term of diversity. Are you allowed to talk about them since you're just the race equity commission? In other words, it's obvious that diversity is more inclusive. And I think what I'm hearing on the counterpoint is by including all these others, you're watering down the race portion. Mm -hmm. But my question is, can this commission meet on these other issues? And if that's the case, can they meet on any other issue too? No, so I would say that that's where you get into the powers and duties. So with the, um, <coughs> so if you look at the purpose statement like in 101, the outset. It's to advise the city council and mayor by applying a race equity analysis to all aspects of governance to maintain engagement with and accountability being done throughout the Bremerton community in service of race equity. Yeah, so it's just race. It's, okay. and, and I think what Quinn was trying to say is that there's intersectionality. Exactly. And it's people who have disabilities that um, is, you know, there's also a, a portion of those people for which what race it, you know, there, there's race is the one that cuts, you know, there's women of color, there's people with disabilities of color, and that if you um, address race, then you can, you know, help a lot of people. But that was, I don't want to paraphrase, but that was, I, 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 you can you absolutely, you can absolutely talk about, right? You can absolutely talk about uh, disability, uh, you know, all these other things that you mentioned in the context of the racial equity lens, absolutely those topics can be brought up, 100%. They have to be, they have to be though, racial related. Mm -hmm. So there has a racial to be equity. intersectionality. Right, so like it's like, well, I mean, there doesn't have to be, they can talk about whatever, you know, but. Well, the, the, the point of the committee is not going to be like, for example, <laughs> talk about like ADA access and, you know, the way they, yeah. and so like if they, you know, what would happen if they did? And I mean, it would be like it, the advice is that they give the council or the mayor is only going to be or you know, what the people put on it. I mean, I guess if they started advising on other issues, I mean, it's, it's just it, it's against the purpose statement. But this may not be germane, but maybe we just need to create a gender equity committee. Do you know that the county of Kitsap has never had a commission on the status of women? Oh, never. Never. At this point, mm -hmm. may I suggest that we leave public comment to the public and await it with open arms yes. and yeah. do everything we can to say, come and comment to us. Yeah. We will bring cookies. Yeah, there's a bad yeah, we'll <laughs> Yes, Anne, but, but the start of this was Eric's question on the legality of what the commission should be able to address. Yeah. So I want to make sure we finish that question. question. I'm going to ask it question. next Wednesday. Yeah. So, no, it's a very well, I think I understand question. your answer, but I, 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 I really think by, by doing that, why would it accept all the comments? But I really think you want to have a, a broad, a scope 
scope as you can. And the DEI gives you that broader scope than the race equity. Just, it just makes sense to me. But. Yeah. Like, uh, going back so, and forth, yeah. real quick, is yeah. just like in Having some fun yet? In work oh. I've done, uh, you know, <coughs> for marriage equality and uh, lifting the military ban and things like that. Like you, you work with allies, you work mm -hmm. with other groups to to move your cause. And, um, you don't leave them behind. Yeah. All right. So I think let's go to um, move it along here. Um, all right. So we'll we'll do public input only, no action anticipated next week. If that's something, no consensus for that. Okay, good. Um, so put that on there, leaving it as is, except for the breakout on the parenthetical. Um, and I just want to summarize of like, I know folks are watching, like, thank you, everybody who's watching yeah. um, for your input. I, this is not, it's not easy. If this was easy, you know, it, it'd be done. Um, so just thank you for everyone for the really, I mean, it's like heartfelt open comments. This requires open discussion. It requires grace. It requires a lot of talking. So um, just thank you to everybody. So we'll get this on for input only. And that will close up our briefings on agenda bill items. All right. And it's only 8.30. <laughs> That's right. All right, Council, how are we feeling? Do we need a short break? to understand 8.30 is nothing. It's true. Right. right. Oh, yeah. Does it mean it's okay? I would like to. Uh, short break? No, I would like to move forward with my short report. Break. I'll do it. All right. And I'll make it. <laughs> Can we move forward with our reports and be done? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Really? All right. In on the series. All right. Overtime. All right, let's move on. General Council Business <laughs> Item C1. Parking Finance Investment and Parking Committee Chair Jennifer Chamberlain provide a summary of the meeting from March 28th. I have no no, I do have a small thing. We covered a lot of our discussion was with Ms. Monroe, so we covered all of that. Um, and then at our next meeting, we're gonna be having um kind of getting ready for our mid-year budget review. So we're gonna get a uh, learning about some other things like how we're collateralized, uh, we're gonna look at our fund balance. Um Budget calendar, uh, look at a master spreadsheet on where we're at. And I really like Michael's suggestion of can we do shared docs, but I don't know if that's going to be a thing we can do. That's it. Thank you. Shared docs. Uh, just a shared doc to be able to, to see like a working document of if there's a budget. Go ahead. The example oh. actually was even for an agenda for a committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's a shared document, and there's this, there's this thing where Every time, like if you send a PDF, IT will know this. If you send an, if, if you send a PDF to everybody, oh, yeah. at the, you just created that many more copies, and they have, and they they take up space, they yeah. take up Sorry, energy. The question, technical, can we do a shared document? Which is obviously no. yes, but can, the, can we the move form to make it a okay. Oh, okay, sorry. It's okay. Yeah. I, I, why are we? This is a oh, lot. Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Okay. We have all the tools. We have all the tools. Yeah. Well, re and it shows the edit history in the documents. There's not a whole bunch of yeah. I like it. So anyway, thank you. That's I. I did not know that was going to be a longer report than like just on shared documents. But it was a good discussion, y'all. Okay, thank you. Sure. <laughs> all right. You know, question next up, uh, Public Safety Committee Chair Denise Fry, a highlight of the meetings April 6th. Yeah, we had Mr. Hersey from your office come in and give us an update on 5536. And um, I think it's passed both houses. So it looks like it's going through. So um, there was a lot of discussion with police and fire and, and Judge Flood about what the impact of something like that. Uh, remind uh, me which. 5536 five, is the, um, Lake uh, uh, yeah, Lake Fix, okay. the banned mm -hmm. substances. And, um, so uh, it obviously will become uh, more of an issue for police and fire as far as um, action taken and what's the impact to the court going to be and all of that. So we did talk about maybe getting some thoughts started from the department heads, from the chiefs and stuff about what the impact will be, um, or, you know, just that we need to be prepared for it. Uh, there is concern about that. And I think there's also just concern about how the bill's going to play out and whether there's going to be funding for social services mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Am I forgetting anything or maybe from oh. your perspective? You can no, I think, you know what? Um, I... 
I think really we're just going to have to hurry up and wait and see what happens with it um, and trust our departments to implement it, whatever it, hap it is, and then we'll see, we'll see if it gets here. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question, and this is going to be a horrible pun. Um, is any, it a father's death? No, no. Okay. I was going to ask, and I don't want to make the measurements later, but was there any fireworks as a discussion of it? <laughs> and I asked because we got public comment last time, you know, asking if, and we mentioned we keep talking about it again. all. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I, you know what, I gotta be real honest, now that I'm not the chair of public safety, I feel like I can say this now, but I really got shamed um, by um, many people in the administration to try to keep that as an uh, agenda item, so I let it kind of fall by the wayside because I don't feel like um, it's something that folks wanted to put much effort into. That's, okay. I got a very shaming um, <laughs> Another example of what Denise talked about earlier, um, just shaming me for wanting to keep this as a, I'm, I should probably stop now, but yeah. I support it. Eric, yeah. So my comment on the fireworks, you don't need to be talking about this. If you, if you really just put it to the vote of the people, let them decide. But there, and there, were, there are multiple issues we're talking about in terms of communication, amending our existing ordinance, uh, amending sales. So you want to ban it or you not? Know, practices, communication. Yeah. And I think okay. we're yeah. really where we had set on that last year, where I was hoping to put some energy into um, and kind of got a little bit of consensus was keeping like at least having some kind of public outreach on good practices, good neighbor handbook, for instance, but mm -hmm. that didn't really yeah. Another court. It's yeah, it's tough to get the motivation going in. Um, I'll leave it up to you if you'd like to bring it back up. Well, it'll come back up, so we'll we'll okay. address it when it comes back up. Maybe it needed to ripen just a little bit more. Sounds good, Michael. I'll leave in your your hands, Chair. Yeah. I, I feel that um, the, the part of the issue is that we can do anything we want with the law, but the public safety folks, police and fire, they, they have no more bandwidth to do anything about it. Well, they will pretty soon. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, just want to ask the question and got public comment yeah. on it. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. No, sorry. This that. Sorry to create fireworks with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're having, yeah. while, we're having, while we're having a real blast, uh, item C3, any regional and other committee boards? Uh, <laughs> I am at Burn. Firecracker today. They just keep uh, all right. Um, I have fired. a I have a quick one. Let me see what I wrote You're down, and then I'll ask if other folks did theirs. My goodness. <laughs> now I can't even find it. So let me see if anyone other. I got it's a transit, transit. Perfect. All right. The thing about being on the Get Up Transit Board is like it's still pretty stunning the sums of money. It's like, oh well. By the way, you know, they have a forty-three million dollar unrestricted reserve. That's just one of their reserves. So we're spending $11.5 million on really good stuff, like 10 electric 40 foot buses. Um, we are spending, and they're fixing up the, the CAD that like tells you where the buses are so you can like actually do it in real time. Um, the, we're doing the uh, hangabout. The pre-design on the uh, Johnson Road uh, park and ride design, which is rather pricey. One thing that came up, you know, just spending money. It, it's just the sums are really enormous. Um, one, two things that came up I thought was really interesting. One was a member of the public uh, commented that Kids Up Transit was totally uh, directed towards commuters. And that like jolted me a little because of course that's true. Um, this would and it's um, the director noted that like with the pandemic, you know everything's with the pandemic. Uh, patterns had changed and people like wanted to like go out and shop or go out and meet or go out and have play dates. Um, this would be a, a strong possibility of getting over the hump of or whatever you call it of like new hires having to just do the morning and the evening um, rush hours, which is what's so discouraging to those to those new young drivers. Um, and uh, I apparently 
I was told that this, this was a, a union thing, and I was like, no, union members would never do that. But apparently, they do. <laughs> um, the senior members have that thing where it's like, you know, we, we went through this hazing, you know, you should go through it too. Mm. That, that was about it, and there will be no QTIP transit meeting later this month. So, yeah. yes, all the questions. I got one real quick go to the order. I got. I found my thing. Um, oh, this was uh, Kita, uh, Kitsap Economic Development Alliance. Um, the mayor and I are on the board, and then they had their annual meeting um, as well. Um, two takeaways: they approved a whole new five-year plan and budget. Um, and I think the takeaway I got out of it was really great outreach and coordination across the county, um, and just kind of again around economics. And then the other one was they they had a really nice um, like economic forecast where they had actually people um, I forget the university, but actual economists, and they were talking about. <laughs> You know, unemployment trends and revenues and um, just the entire outlook. And I think my takeaway was for everything they bring up and they'd be like, are we in a recession now? Well, what's the definition? And what's the, and they'd go, well, we're in weird times. And, you know, somebody will say you can't have a recession with when we only have a focus on unemployment because that, but, but we're low because of these metrics and the, all these trends are changing. And so, oh gosh, I'll see if I can find a little PowerPoint. It was really illuminating, but I think, um, and I bring this up because going into budget season, right, we're going to be saying, what, what is the projection? Um, and I think it's just, a, it's pretty unknown. Like I think if anyone says, yeah. I can confidently say we're steady, or, it, it, it was just in weird times still was my takeaway. So um, you know, there was a lot of optimism and a lot of like, yeah. Economists, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it to talk about it. But... Good, good data download, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought one comment that was made at last week's meeting was like really accurate, which is if you are not six foot tall or taller, you can't be seen, like you can't see over those screens and you, you're just, you are invisible. Um, you can't see sorry. me behind them. You can't see, yeah. Oh, I, oh, I would have been happy. I'm so sorry, I thought you were talking about PETA. Okay, yeah, some of that. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm, just, I'm, just, on I'm the, so sorry. I'm going to set up down here. I don't know what okay. to say about economists, Joe. Okay. Yeah, I, I was talking about <laughs> Just it, it, it yeah. would be it would be really great if there was some way. And I feel like this has to be off-putting the whole way we do it. It's like you make people come and stand there like they're supplicants and we're up on a dais and that's already like a lot. And then to have those screens like blocking us, it's just it's a little too much. So I'm just saying that. So I wonder if IT day. can help yeah. us, or maybe we can get a little bit <laughs> better chairs that actually. You can get smaller monitors when you get back. You couldn't see. You couldn't see. Yeah. So then maybe we need new chairs so that short people can be higher. The chairs. Not inside. Of a, Clearly, not of a monitor, but inside. Can we just admit that it might have been designed for men? Can we just admit that? <laughs> So, uh, Heavens no. Can't do that. Whatever we do. Before I have to feel guilt for being over six feet. <laughs> there are some six feet. I want to come up with a solution that way. I don't have to I chose guilt. none of this. How about phone okay. books? And the solution is phone you books. Put, you put the tablet inside the thing so it's not. Yeah, we tried that. There's no support on the inside of that diet. So right. I'm just so saying they would have to do a whole move the monitors so that we can peek out around. Move your chair and have wheels. I do. It's really I, I to look like Instead of putting a chair in front of a monitor, you put the monitors here, you can look at If people. the chair were higher, your feet will be dangling too. Okay, I have a quick go to the order, really sure, quick. Sure. Have one more after. Okay, regarding economics, um, the great gift happened yesterday. Yeah. Yes, but they were way, way, way down from the past few years. And so, and I thought, and I'm like involved with a nonprofit and I felt really bad. I was like, did I do something wrong? No, everybody. And so that might be as people are still feeling like they're in a recession, whether that's a sign of it or not. But kudos to Kitsap Community Foundation and United Way and all the non, 362 nonprofits, I believe, were involved in that. So, and hats off to folks that donated and I mean, I could have saved that for a city council meeting. Yeah, but no, good to You can share it again at <laughs> city council. Maybe. It's good, yeah. I mean, right. it's good. Yeah. And again. <laughs> Thank you. A reminder, the Navy's coming next week. Oh, um, the Navy's coming. So, Every uh, nice girl. I got a comment. Um, <laughs> Stay for the I believe it was on it. Troops. Like, oh, no. What? The Navy's 
Right. So as, far, as far as anything you wanted them to address. I sent you the license. Yes, yeah, I got yeah. So if you have anything else, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Who's the color uh, guard coming? Uh, regular council meeting, not a study? The, yeah, they're going to present at the regular meeting. I know. Mm -hmm. I'm still, we're, we we're, Laura and I are following back up with the color guard. Is are we doing a, a color guard? Um, He's good about feeding them about 15 minutes to address let the, the mayor. Yeah. Let's let all the people who come to comment know that we're going to be doing a color card. Yeah, so that was part of that idea. So, Good. Um, <laughs> anyway, so anything to give feedback, let me know by like tomorrow at noon, and then I'll make sure to fully uh, incorporate that. And the last item, the very last item, is thank you, Dave. Yay! Yay. 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 Yeah. Do we make him stay for every one of these study sessions? Ah, uh, uh, watch closely. Yeah, he's he's the building. Yeah. He's, he's, he's teaching yeah. us how to fish so that we can. Yeah. Still get our own. Oh. Okay. Good. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Good job. Because these are great. This sounds really sounds terrible. Mm -hmm. yeah. This guy's got a PhD. I don't think you need to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a PhD in technology. Buttons, right. Zoomology. Yeah. Zoomology? Zoomology. Zoomology. Yeah. All right. Well, that, see, nothing. Uh, oh. The next city council meeting is held Wednesday, April 19th, 2023, at 5.30 p.m. in the first floor chambers with the remote option available. Meeting is adjourned.